makes it harder for, you know, dogs to track you. If that's true or not, I, I don't know. Um, but they were saying that he might have been using the waterways. And, you know, another thing that was brought up were those intricate uh, piping system at Longwood Gardens. And you, the other day on Sunday, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens was asked about that, and he, he did confirm that they did receive blueprints uh, from Longwood Gardens so that they could explore uh, the piping that is, you know, underneath there um, to see if there was a possibility that he entered through that piping system. Now, Friday night of last week, uh, there was, that's when they thought that he was in the perimeter of Longwood Gardens, right? And I was out there. Uh, we had to uh, kill our live shot because there was so much lightning. And probably about 11.45, it was like a torrential downpour. And you know, I was talking to um, Tom Kelly, who's one of our photographers that I was working with, and I said, this is, he's going to use this. He's going to use this torrential downpour to, to try to shield him from you know, from view, because you couldn't see in front of you. And even if with all those troopers that were out there along the perimeter, if some of them were in vehicles, they might just not have been able to see if he were to dodge in front of them. So they think one of the potentials of how he breached that perimeter, if you will, out of the Longwood Gardens area um, could have been under the the cover of the rain, um, or was it through the piping system. So there's still a lot of questions about um, that they're, they're probably hoping to get answered to. Um, and I'd be curious to see how forthcoming he is with, with a lot of his information about how he was able to stay on the run so long and, and make movements. And so when he breached that perimeter, going back to, to last Friday uh, or Friday to Saturday, when he left that area and then he stole that dairy van from Bailey's Dairy Farm, um, that was about three quarters of a mile from the Longwood Gardens perimeter, and when he stole that van, that's where he was able to make it about 20 miles uh, to the East Dampnell Township area. And so yesterday, in talking with one of the investigators, um, I said, well, wow, you know, doesn't that makes it so that he's, you know, he's smart enough to move, he's smart enough to get out there. And the investigator said something very telling to me. He said, yeah, but he wasn't smart enough to drive away from, you know, drive out of Pennsylvania. So why would you go to an area where, you know, you know people? I guess in his mind it was to try to get help because he needed resources. But, you know, their point was if he was really smart, he would have driven out of the state and figured out a way to get a couple of states away because that would have made it, made it really difficult. But initially on Sunday when all those developments happened, um, there was a – thought that at that point he was definitely he was going to get ca captured and so Sunday the momentum was really high and then Monday evening the momentum was really high and I will also tell you that investigators were really concerned and that's that's an obvious conclusion you can come to obviously because there was a homeowner who fired shots who was put in danger because he was in front of this escaped murderer who now you know had stolen his weapon so the cause for concern has always been high by investigators but the desperation and its level of desperation as that climbed to get higher there were fears about who could get hurt you know, could a law, member of law enforcement get hurt, a member of the community get hurt? And as they inch closer and closer and this kept going on and on, the odds of that happening uh, were higher. So there's still, I have so many questions for Danilo Cavalcante. I mean, I'm just, it's, this whole escape has just been, you know, it's fascinating to watch from, from a media perspective, uh, just the fact that he was even able to get out of that facility, um, the sheer will to be able to climb up over a wall, yeah. run across the roof, jump out, walk onto a main road in plain sight, calmly. Yeah, um, they initially said the reason why he was spotted was that it was a prison uh, employee that was driving by. Uh, that happened to notice him because of what he was wearing. Um, what if that hadn't happened? How much of a lead would he have had? Would he have still stayed within the area that he knew um, best? But again, 8.15 is around the time that he was captured. Uh, he was found, um, uh, no, 
I'm getting, I'm sorry, I'm getting a few text messages, but he was found within that perimeter again, hiding under foliage. Um, again, that perimeter was that one that was established on Monday after those most recent developments um, where the homeowner was able to fire a couple shots um, at him. That homeowner uh, did live on Coventryville Road, but that was within that perimeter that includes PA 23 to the north, PA 100 to the east, Fairview and Knapp Mill Roads to the south, and Iron Bridge and County Park Roads to the west. And that was the northern edge of the search perimeter. And again, last night around midnight, you started to hear a lot of that standard traffic uh, talking about tracking uh, a heat source. And there was a lot of thought since it was a little cooler last night. And from what I was told from investigators, that that is um, better conditions, more ideal conditions for that type of technology. Um, but really, too, what you're tracking out there is I'm sure when you have something monitoring heat sources on the ground over a very, very big area, um, about eight, squat, eight square mile area of thick vegetation, where there's also a lot of wildlife, I'm sure there's a lot popping up there, coyotes, deer, um, what have you, what else is out there. So, But it sounds like they were successful in finally tracking him down. Again, it was state police's tactical team, their border patrol tactical team, um, and another Number of those federal agencies uh, sent over some of their tactical teams as well. Uh, the FBI has had their SWAT team out there. U.S. Marshals, um, their national team, um, I believe, was expected to arrive um, either yesterday or today. Um, by the way, the and, and I don't think they were involved in this arrest, but the, for the Eric Freen manhunt, which I was just talking about in 2014, um, it was, I believe, the U.S. Marshals uh, national tactical team that actually uh, found Eric Freen. So, but again, um, back to today, day 14, 8.15 this morning, this is all coming to a conclusion. Um, still want to get some more um, information about where he is going to next. Uh, and I was saying about just a short time ago, you know, what the possibilities are. And what I was told initially is that the possibilities are if he is injured, seriously injured, then he would have to go to a hospital. Uh, if he is doesn't have any serious injuries, but, you know, this is a guy that's been out for 14 days, and if he's in the custody, um, Oh, you know yeah, what? Yeah, and those really those want to take this call. Can I talk yes. back to you guys? Yes, Annie. Yes, stand by because we. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Annie. Thanks, we Annie. are getting we are getting a statement from Chester County Commissioner Marianne Moskowitz. Uh, she's releasing this statement saying the capture of Cavalcante ends the nightmare of the past two weeks. We thank every single law enforcement official at the regional, state, and federal level that was out in all weather conditions all day, all night. Uh, they went on to say that the Chester County prison officials have made some immediate changes to bolster security in the prison, have brought in security contractors to make permanent changes to the exercise yards and are reviewing and where needed changing procedures for both security measures and communication to residents who live close to the prison. On Monday, I was at the news conference in Unionville, Matt, and I was speaking with law enforcement and I said, you know, now that it's been at that time had been 12 days. Now that it's been 12 days, this investigation has been ongoing. The search is ongoing. Where are we at with the Chester County prison, mm -hmm. prison and where were the weaknesses within their system and their infrastructure to kind of enable something like this to happen. How was he able to get out? We see the video of him kind of making his way up the wall to get over, but where are the weaknesses there? We know sure. there were weaknesses in the perimeter that were set up, and they said those are weaknesses that they just could not get around. But moving forward, how is a Chester County prison going to assess that? And now we're learning that they are making some changes, yeah. but it would be good to find out the details. Stakes so high with the prison, with the people right. who live around it. The stakes were so high with anyone who lived around the search areas worried that an individual who was convicted of murder was believed to be carrying around a rifle and already someone uh, had shot at someone matching his description. Uh, Chad Perdelli has been covering this story for us as well and he joins us live on the phone with some of his own information and reporting. Chad, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Yeah, obviously this is a very fluid situation. Uh, I'm talking to sources as we speak and information is coming in. Uh, as you know, uh, Cavalcante was uh, captured a short while ago near Route 100 and Prizer Road. I'm told by sources that uh, tactical teams, uh, you know, outside the Pennsylvania State Police and the Pennsylvania State Police team 
found his whereabouts using some thermal technology. You got to remember, overnight, some of the temperatures have actually dropped a bit compared to what we've seen over the past week and a half or 12, 13, 14 days. So uh, they were able to use that thermal technology overnight, find his whereabouts. I'm told he was found under a log. Those tactical teams obviously found his location, began, began to move in, took him into custody. Uh, you've seen some of those chopper images. Uh, he looked bloodied a little bit on his head. Uh, don't know the severity of his injuries at this point. Again, very fluid situation. Uh, still trying to gather information. I'm told he's now going to be going to uh, the Pennsylvania State Police Avondale Barracks. Uh, the the uh, interview process will then begin to learn more information about how he was on the lam for 14 days until his capture here today. But certainly a relief for everyone uh, living in that area. It's been a long 14 days uh, to get him in custody, but uh, certainly Pennsylvania State Police and law enforcement across the region are relieved that they finally captured this guy. And it looks like finally uh, the weather cooperated that, you know, you've been dealing with rain, you know, there's been fog at night that uh, has uh, hindered the efforts as law enforcement has tried to move in and capture him. But, you know, yesterday when they, you know, got that real time tip, when he had that encounter with the homeowner and stole that rifle, that was a real key moment because they've been w waiting to get real time tip. You know, some of the other tips were delayed by a couple of hours. So obviously he had a chance to, uh, to move and to get away. But once that real time tip, they began to squeeze uh, his location uh, using that thermal technology. They were able to uh, pinpoint his location and, uh, and they found him under a log. And now Danilo Cavalcante is in custody and uh, certainly a relief to everyone living in that region. Yeah, Chad, it's been it's incredible to hear kind of the details that you're getting from the tac tactical teams about using thermal technology, finding him under a log. We've known all along that because of his size, you know, five foot, 120 pounds, it's very easy for him to get into small, tiny crevices to hide. So that worked to his advantage. Law enforcement on Monday saying that while they were working on Danilo Calvacante's game now, it's a law, it's law enforcement's game, and they were working the long game. They said he was growing more desperate, so I'm, I'm happy that that led to his capture. We do have some reverse 911 calls that were sent out to residents this morning. Law enforcement said they would notify residents when they captured him. Let's take a listen to those calls. This is an important message from Reddy Chesco. Please do not hang up. This is a message from the Pennsylvania State Police. The search for Danilo Cavalcante is over. The subject is now in custody. Yeah, imagine hearing that when yeah. you wake up in the morning around that search area. So that's what went out to all the residents out there. Chad, I know you're still with us. And uh, yeah. you, you, you said a couple of times he was found beneath a log. It's like the most primitive place for one to hide when you have all the technology that the police were using to try to find him. That kind of st stuck out to me uh, that his downfall was basically sitting in the middle of the woods underneath a log. Well, I mean, like you said, he's diminutive. He's, uh, as uh, um, Aliana was pointing out, he's small. And so, you know, obviously this guy's been hiding in this brush. I mean, this has been some, you know, really treacherous terrain for law enforcement to do their search. I mean, you're talking deep woods. You had all those ravines. You had some of those underground tunnels that uh, state police suspect he may have used to escape that uh, original perimeter. So, I mean, this, these were some brutal conditions in terms of finding, you know, Danilo Cavalcante. But at the end of the day, I mean, I really think this thermal technology talking to some of my sources was really key in finally pinpointing a location so they could really move in and know exactly where they're going to go. Because literally, you know, he's under a log. If you didn't have maybe some of that technology, you could walk right by him. I mean, that's how deep the brush is in, in, in that entire region. So... It was uh, really helpful for him in his escape and to, and to, to be on the run for those, uh, you know, 13, 14 days. But uh, they finally got him. And, uh, you know, now the investigative process will play out. And, and they'll, you know, obviously try to learn more about how he was able to escape, learn more about how he was able to break the, uh, their perimeter uh, and, and learn more about uh, what they can learn going forward in some of these searches because you know state police Chad, have conducted a number of these over the years you think of freeing up there on the poconos and, and and you know they're difficult searches and you know the public obviously is like why can't you catch this guy but 
it's really not that easy, and they're doing their best, and they're they're trying to squeeze them and find them, but it can be very difficult, and you have to work. Chad, with what we're you getting have. we're getting some new information. I'm sorry to interrupt. Stand by one second. We want to bring Annie McCormick back in. Annie, I know that you had to go because you were getting some calls and some messages. What are you learning right now? We have a little bit more information, and this is interesting. So that perimeter that they established on Monday, the one that we've been talking about, we show our viewers the map of it. They actually made an even smaller perimeter within that perimeter last night. Um, some storms came through, and then this morning when they went in, it was a dog that was part of the state police's tactical team or the Border Patrol's tactical team, and it was that dog that got a hit. And now I'm told that he was under not only foliage but also a pile of logs and that's where the dog did locate him now there's some reports that he was bit by the dog i don't know whether or not uh that is true yet um if he was bit again he will get you know medical attention um and he's going to be taken now to state police barracks avondale um and then from there uh depending on obviously the severity of his injuries um he will be transported to SDI Phoenix. And again, we were talking earlier, I was, you know, mentioning about how, you know, the normal protocol is to take them to, uh, you would take somebody to the county correctional facility of, you know, where they are arrested. Uh, but in this situation, obviously, he proved that he can get out of that. So that's why they're just going straight ahead, saying we're just going to put him into the state uh, institution. Uh, maybe they feel that he's more secure there. I, I don't know if that's the, the idea of it. But so they're going to take him to Avondale and then to that facility, SDI Phoenix, uh, over by Greater Um, But what's interesting is, is that, you know, there's so many times that probably groups went through with a canine team um, and that got hit, you know, on his scent. And over the past couple of days, uh, also, too, with the public, I don't think, realize, and we're, as we're starting to learn more information and more details are coming out about what happened over the past 14 days, is how close investigators were several times to getting him and in one instance in Longwood Gardens I've heard from some sources that they were incredibly close to the point that it was they themselves were, were incredibly frustrated so the momentum built each time that there's a near capture and you know the the momentum builds and and they were they were ready to go that's why Monday Monday night I mean we really thought that that was going to be the night but it sounds like you know they were patient they had that technology that was up again we were talking about the one that can monitor heat on the ground um that played a role they were hoping to track him using that uh last evening and i think from using that they were able to pinpoint and then make that smaller perimeter within the perimeter that we were showing you yesterday again that was on pa 23 between PA 100 to the east, Fairview and Yount Mill Road, it was within that area, and also Iron Bridge and County Park Road. So now expect to see a convoy. I don't know. I'm since I'm I'm on the phone. I don't know what you're seeing um, right now as far as video, but um, expect to see a convoy with armored vehicles, heavily secured. You know, moving moving this guy. I mean, he's only it's it, he's only five feet tall and 120 pounds. Yet this man is going to have more protection and more security than probably some of the biggest, potentially most physically dangerous inmates that they that they may have because uh, they're going to make sure that this guy never gets out again. And, you know, immediately what I started to think of was the relief that the Brandau family must have, how terrified those children must have been during this entire search um Cavill Conti's victim of course I'm referring to her family uh she was you know murdered in 2021 and you know her sister Sarah had Deborah is her name but her sister Sarah had done several interviews um talking about how scary it, it was for them and initially when he went missing or should I say escape rather uh, they put protection for the family members of his victims, um, her family, but also the people who testified against him, too, um, because there were several of his friends who had assisted in helping him elude capture back in 2021 when he fled to Virginia uh, that then were on the stand and testified against him. And, and they didn't know whether or not 
he was going to harm them. Um, you know what? I'm getting another call. I really want to take Aliana. Can I sure. can I toss it back to you? Please do. Matt, you got to do your reporting, uh, Annie. Okay. Uh, get back to us uh, as soon as you can. We have a live look at the uh, Unionville Police Station where we will be c carrying a news conference for you at 9:30 this morning. So please do stand by for uh, additional news surrounding the capture of Danello Cavalcante. Eliana, I was thinking as. Uh, uh, um, Annie was talking about, you know, the danger uh, posed there, and I guess we can characterize the murder in Schuylkill Township as a crime of passion. It was his ex-girlfriend, but how, how worried state police were that the violence would be uh, directed towards someone else he didn't know just because he wanted to maintain uh, his escape status and not be captured. Uh, and sure enough, under a pile of logs somewhere in the brush of rural northern Chester County, uh, state police get a hit from a dog and perhaps also using their tools with infrared technology that finally worked once mm -hmm. the temperatures went down. Well, and exactly, and you hit it right there. I think a lot of people were nervous because of what happened with his, with his ex-girlfriend with that situation. I mean, when you are... Uh, in a relationship or you're in a situation and there's anger involved and you know he's accused or was convicted rather of stabbing her multiple times in front of her children it is it's a brutal crime so of course law enforcement all along were like we cannot you know while we know that he's in Pennsylvania we know that he's in Chester County we know that he's in these areas we cannot underestimate him and what he's capable of so neighbors of course were concerned about that and when you had that run in with the gentleman at, in the garage and he found that rifle that intensified the fear because now he's armed with a 22 caliber rifle walking around Chester County rural parts again his size right can hide very easily so this is something that people were saying okay now he's got he's already gotten a help hold of a van now he's got a rifle what can he do next so the fact that this is all coming to an end finally after nearly two weeks is such a relief sure. for so many people right now I want to talk about this uh, this thermal technology that Chad and Annie were talking about with tactical teams because I think for people at home who are watching and listening to this they're thinking you know um, crime drama shows and things like that but how does this thermal technology come into play is this something that they're using um, with tools and devices from an aerial view is this something that they're using on the ground as we see them sifting through brush and that sort of thing here uh, how does that look well, uh, I can tell you that the state police will be talking more about that during the news conference at 9:30. Uh, it, they they had said all along that we think we're we're, we're having problems with it because it's so hot and so everything is hot and the in, uh, in, for infernal technology doesn't really work there. Catherine Scott has also uh, been reporting on this all morning long, every morning throughout the week, and joins us live now outside the news conference uh, with a preview of what's going to happen. Catherine, what do you have for us? Well, we're just arriving here. We were at the search zone earlier this morning and we were watching as uh, law enforcement would be checking vehicles and they had their flash lights looking in trunks of the car. So this was happening early this morning in that search perimeter, perimeter, a really unnerving situation for the people who live here. But now we're at uh, the command center where there's going to be a press conference here at 930. It's set to begin. Let me tell you, this is a really different set of circumstances than how it felt yesterday morning around this time. Yesterday morning, we were also here for a 930 press conference, and that's when we learned more about how Danilo Cavalcante had obtained a weapon on Monday night, come in contact with a homeowner in an open garage, grabbed a rifle that had a flashlight and a scope and ammunition and was on the run. You know, we've been following this obviously for the last two weeks since it happened. And we've been listening to law enforcement about the challenging circumstances that they've encountered in both of their main search zones. Of course, most recently they were in South Coventry Township, East Nant Mill, uh, Warwick Townships, uh, but also over by Chester County Prison. I was there the day after he escaped and we were there. You know, we have the morning live shots. It's overnight hours. We pulled into across from Chester County Prison, uh, you know, 3.30 in the morning. It is pitch black there. You can't see anything off the road. So, and of course, they're dealing with these hot temperatures. They're dealing with challenging terrain. When they were over by Longwood Gardens, there were tunnels. Uh, there were so many different ways out. And the state police have said over and over again that no perimeter is 100% secure. 
And so even though they were throwing all these resources at this, he was able to get away um, and they weren't helped by the weather. They weren't helped by the terrain. Uh, there are some waterways in the search zone that they were concentrating on over the last few days. So we're waiting to hear more about exactly what happened. But we know early this morning um, that the equipment was all in place. The helicopter from state police was in the air looking for different hits from their infrared technology, seeing if they could find more about where Cavalcante could be hiding. Um, able to evade capture for the last two weeks now, but now we know that it's over and that he's in custody. And of course, we're here. This press conference is set to get underway at 930. They've been very prompt with the press conferences, so we're hoping to learn more exactly about what happened pretty soon. Hey. Catherine, thank you so much for that live report, and we will stay with Catherine as this news conference develops. Uh, that Again, we're expecting that at 9.30 with Pennsylvania State Police. All right, well, uh, Annie McCormick has just given us more information. Uh, it doesn't get any odder than this. Uh, Danilo Cavalcante was found wearing an Eagles sweatshirt when he was captured this morning at about 8.14. Uh, he's changed clothes at least once and now we know twice. Uh, first with that light colored sweatshirt, the hoodie you see right there. And now uh, it's a coincidence, but one to be noted on the day before the Eagles home opener, the most sought after person in the entire state, if not the entire Northeast, is wearing an Eagle sweatshirt. Yeah, and this this kind of goes to what law enforcement were talking about. They would not say whether someone is helping or was helping Danilo Cavalcante in his escape and continuous evade from police, but they had alluded to it um, in a way that caused all of us reporters who were there at that news conference on Monday to say, so are you saying that someone is helping him or is not helping him? And we know that we know that Danilo Cavacante's sister is in now in deportation, the deportation process, um, and was not cooperating with law enforcement at one point, and was not necessarily not assisting Danilo Cavacante. They would not confirm whether she is or is not assisting him. So we feel and know that there may have been someone helping him. Chopper 6 is now live over Route 100 in Chester County, and what you see is the vehicle we believe that Danilo Cavacante is in right now. Uh, the most protected prisoner uh, in the entire country, perhaps, mm -hmm. in that vehicle right now. It is heading down to Route 1's, one of the major arteries down there, to head to the state police barracks in Avondale, where our reporters say Cavalcante will be examined. If he needs some medical treatment, he might get it there, or he might go to a, one of the nearby hospitals there. Eliana, one of the other things that uh, we might want to emphasize uh, that Annie told us is that when Cavalcante was found, we were wondering what types of injuries he mm -hmm. may have. Yeah. Was he indeed shot or not during that confrontation a few days ago? She said at the very least, it seemed like he had some some wounds, some bloodied uh, areas on his head. Yeah, and then Annie did also mention that there may, there were some reports that a dog was part of the tactical team that captured Cavalcante this morning and that that dog had gotten a hit and there's some reports that maybe he was bitten by the search dog. So what we still need to find out from law enforcement if the blood that we were seeing on Cavalcante this morning during his arrest is from maybe the dogs or maybe perhaps from the eight shots that that homeowner fired in East Providence or South Providence Township on uh, on Monday. So again, we are still trying to find out information about uh, his physical appearance, whether he's going to need medical attention, and of course more on all of this 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 capture and how he was able to evade. I have a good feeling that we will learn some more information sure. so about sure. who, if anyone, may have been helping him. Yeah, you, you've been covering this. Everyone knows how scared people were being in their houses, having to lock themselves up, lock up their belongings, their uh, garages, uh, the school districts, uh, Owen J. Roberts being one of them, yeah. uh, having to cl cancel classes. So just to reset here, Danilo Cavalcante is now in police custody. He is in that armored vehicle that you're watching right now as it proceeds down Route 100 on the way to the state police barracks in Avondale. He was captured at 814 this morning and he his condition right now is not known, but they say he is alive and he's going back to jail. And we're taking a live look right now at South Coventry Township where Danilo Cavalcante was captured at 814 this morning. You may be seeing some smiling faces and that's because there have been more than 300 law enforcement officers on the ground 
searching for this man for the last two weeks. So obviously they're standing by now that the search is done. He is captured in custody in an armored vehicle heading to Avondale. And they are now, it looks like, kind of making their way out of that search area. Again, relief for more than 300 law enforcement officers who have been going day and night, hours on hours on hours, little sleep, little food, little drink, to, little to drink at this point just to find this man. Yeah, so two things that might have played in the police, uh, police's favor. Uh, first of all, you had the temperatures dip a little bit uh, overnight. That is when the infrared technology that they're using to try to, to find any sort of human activity in the woods started to work a little bit more. Once again, live picture, Chopper 6. That is where Cavalcante is being transported in that armored van, heavily armored van, I might add. Mm -hmm. Also, you had the rains moved in, which perhaps caused Cavalcante, who was unable to find shelter, gets himself underneath a pile of logs. He's wearing an Eagle sweatshirt. Uh, he's tired. He's hungry. He's, he's thirsty. He has been on the run for 14 days. And then you get the hit from the, the police dog. Uh, they, they go in, they find him, and finally, this whole nightmare for so many people is over. Yeah, and again, we did get a statement earlier from the Chester County Commissioner about just obviously this the relief that this nightmare is over, but also touching on the fact that when we go to day one, where all this started from the Chester County Prison, where were the weaknesses within the prison? W was it an infrastructural weakness? Was it that the, the guards missed this? We know that the tower guard that was monitoring that day had been fired because Cavalcante was able to escape. So now Chester County commissioners are coming out and saying, we are making some immediate changes to the Chester County prison system. We are adjusting and we would like to, of course, know and the American public would like to know what those changes are so we hope that this does not happen again and maybe the third thing that played in the state police favor is something they did on their own so they had that eight mile uh, radius uh, where they were searching in northern Chester County, including um, East Nat Mill Township, South Coventry Township. And what they were able to do when the, the rains moved across mm -hmm. is to say, yes, let's close this in a little bit more. There's probably not going to be a lot of movement with this guy. And they get it down to a smaller space. And then there you go. They're able to find him. Yeah, that homeowner, uh, that encounter with that homeowner was key. It intensified the search. It made things, it gave police more of a narrow focus because on Monday during that news conference that we had about three o'clock, law enforcement said our focus is no longer narrowed in one particular area. Now our focus, now it's a, it's a wider range. So we're at a bit of a disadvantage and we do have um, uh, challenges in terms of the landscape. So, but that encounter triggered everything. So Annie McCormick is back with us on the phone. She's been reporting on this. Annie, we're taking a look at Chopper 6 video of the armored vehicle uh, that contains Danilo Cavalcante. Your thoughts as the police say, we're not going to let this guy get away again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This guy is going to have more protection, is going to have more security than probably any other inmate in the state of Pennsylvania. And again, I'm looking at the chopper video too. that convoy now heading over to the state police's Avondale barracks. Now, um, Aliana, I heard you talking about seeing blood um, on Cavalcante. I, I don't know if the blood that you're speaking of is specifically from this, but I do have confirmed that he was bit. Uh, by one of the canine units uh, that did find him. Um, again, telling me that he was also confirmed wearing an Eagle sweatshirt, a gray Eagle sweatshirt. And um, that has to be probably a new piece of clothing that he acquired too, because if you remember on Monday night, uh, they found some of his discarded clothing near that homeowner's um, residence on Coventryville Road after that homeowner fired several shots at him. So they weren't sure if he if he meant to discard that clothing or if he just, you know, in a panic ran. And last night was significantly cooler over the past 14 days. He must have gotten that sweatshirt uh, along the way. He also, the other day, of course, stole those work boots uh, as well. So, again, he was found um, just around just after 8 o'clock is when those Teams moved in there. Canine unit sniffed him out. He was hiding under foliage and also logs. And that is when, at some point, canine dog bit him uh, and he was taken into custody. So he, and if you see that armored vehicle there, I was actually told 
uh, something by a member of law enforcement the other day when I saw a number of those um, tactical units and they use a lot of those. I hope my Annie, just one second, you. just one second, stand by one second. We are getting our first picture of Danilo Cavalcante during his capture this morning by state police and law enforcement officials. This is it here. Annie was just talking about that gray Eagle sweatshirt. You see him there. He's still wearing those uh, pants from the Chester County prison, the work boots that perhaps were stolen. But there is our first look at the escaped inmate, Danilo Cavalcante, being captured by police this morning, looking very disheveled. I yeah, in fact, if you knew nothing of the context of this picture, you'd say this person looks like they've been on the run for 14 days. And in yeah. fact, that is what he looks like. His clothes uh, look like they've, they're rain soaked, uh, muddy. His hair is disheveled and it's all over his face. And the expression, what little we can see of it right now, looks like a, a man who has been worn out by the constant surveillance, the constant searching, and the constant work that our uh, law enforcement uh, teams have been uh, taking over these past 14 days. And they finally got their guy, and mm -hmm. thank goodness, thank goodness, no one, even uh, on the police side or just uh, any of the residents uh, surrounding these search areas, no one has been hurt. And you have to imagine, knowing now that he's armed with that 22 caliber rifle that he stole from that garage, law enforcement had to approach with caution, knowing that he's armed, but had to catch him in a vulnerable spot, which it sounds like he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, back to Chopper 6 now. That's the armored vehicle. Uh, this is the uh, probably one of the most uh, secure transport vehicles that one can find to take a prisoner who not only broke out of a jail mm -hmm. in uh, the state of Pennsylvania in Chester County, but also managed to elude authorities in another country in Brazil where he is suspected of co committing another murder. Danilo Cavalcante is waiting in traffic right now on this Wednesday morning headed to the state police barracks in Avondale where he will be processed, where he will be checked out and they will go from there and we will should hear during this news conference at 930 what their plans are, where he might go next. I can guarantee it's not the Chester County prison in Pocopson Township. Definitely not. They're they're likely going to send him somewhere much farther away because clearly in the Chester County prison one of the things that we saw during this process is that he was trying to make contact with previous roommates, acquaintances, anyone in the area still where he escaped, which is just a few miles away from the prison. So he was still able to, on foot, get to these homes to try to make contact. We heard him on the Ring Doorbell uh, video that he was trying to speak to his roommate and saying, I want you to meet with me in a separate location privately because he was looking for assistance. Um, but we do want to take a moment to go out to uh, Catherine Scott live at the command center uh, in Unionville. We're awaiting this news conference seven minutes away. Catherine, we know they have been on time. There are a slew of questions I can imagine, many coming from you. Oh, so many questions about what exactly happened this morning. I think once he obtained that gun the other night, there was so much concern with people in the community, with law enforcement about how this was going to end before he didn't have a gun. But then once he was armed, uh, would he try to carjack a car? Would he try to shoot at law enforcement? People were so concerned about what would happen, but it sounds like he was taken into custody um, and no shots were fired from at least the sounds of it right now. And you can see I'm giving you a live look right now of where everybody is gathering, awaiting the press conference, which is just about five minutes away. Um, and I want to go back to something Aliana and Matt you guys were talking about because as we were standing here somebody came over a, a resident she was visiting the nearby post office and she was talking a lot about how grateful she was for his capture but also going back to that vulnerability around the prison she said she walks in that park nearby all the time she's often by herself and there's concern in the community about what changes are going to be made to bolster security in the prison and there was that statement that came out today from the Chester County commissioners um, talking about how they brought in security contractors to make permanent changes to the exercise yards how they're reviewing and changing procedures for security measures and communication to residents 
who live close by the prison because uh, this is not the first time somebody has broken out of that prison. There was one just months ago. Obviously, in this case, it was a more high profile case. This was somebody who was convicted for a recent murder. Um, and and so therefore, you know, people were following this one closely and obviously he evaded capture for two weeks. But there's certainly concern about the vulnerability around that prison and what changes are going to be made. But obviously a lot of relief here. Um, this happened 24 hours or 24 hours ago. We were here for another press conference when they were talking more about how he obtained the gun and how they were trying to find him. They had narrowed down this area, but it wasn't a narrow area. It was about eight square miles. Uh, but obviously they were able to find him with the help of the cave. And of course, I'm going to go inside in, in just a minute uh, to make sure I'm there for the start of the press conference. But um, we do intend to hear more details very shortly about what exactly happened. Catherine, you go ahead and uh, I know you have to do some reporting. You'll be there for the news conference. Eliana, we just learned that Governor Josh Shapiro, who was there yesterday um, monitoring the police efforts and getting a sense of what's going on, will be at this news conference as well. So we'll expect to see him there. And I was just thinking, uh, you know, Catherine and I, we come in very early and we uh, were waking up just as these storms were moving through. Right. And it seems like the storms were really the, the straw that broke the camel's back in kickstarting all these events today that eventually led to Cavalcante's capture and not discounting the amount of work that we've seen from 24 hours, seven day of the state police and their teams. Oh, absolutely. And, we, and, and law enforcement have been doing an incredible job. And, you know, I know there are neighbors and people and naysayers out there who are frustrated with the process. But, you know, this is we're just on the outside. We don't know the very intricate details that go into all of this. We don't know um, details about the tactical and thermal technology that these teams were using. But we know now that it worked. We know that it led them to Danilo Cabo Conte. And we know that during these news conferences, state police have said all along, we know he's in Pennsylvania. We know he's in Chester County. And so they had an idea of where he was. It was just a matter of getting him right on that trail, finding him in that location. Um, so we're happy that that has come to a close at this point, and we are awaiting this news conference from law enforcement where we will learn more information. But there are a number of questions, right? You know, when we were looking at the map and it showed the different locations where he was spotted, we, known locations where he was found or seen, it makes you wonder how was he able to navigate this type of terrain, these rural communities, this brush, Longwood Gardens, all of these locations without a device, right? Every day we use devices to get around, whether it's, you know, Google or Apple Maps. We we have these things at our fingertips to get around. How is he able to navigate this terrain and these communities that he may only be somewhat familiar with but haven't seen in a few years or however long he's been in the Chester County Prison? So there are those questions. Who was helping him? How was he able to get some of these things, food, water, clothing. We know that he stole some boots. We know that he got the gun in the van um, by means of stealing. But how was he able to get through this process 14 days in evading police? Yeah. Again, we're taking a look at that photo again of Danilo Cavalcante's capture this morning. You have to wonder, and, and Annie McCormick, uh, let me bring you in uh, to talk more about this. You have to wonder if Danilo Cavalcante had ever intended to leave the area if he tried to and just gave up? And if not, Annie, why didn't he want to leave the area? We know L Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens of the state police said on Sunday and again Monday that he did not think that he had the resources to leave the state of Pennsylvania. And what I was told by one investigator was, you know, if he was really smart. He would have found some way to get more fuel to put in that van, maybe ditch that van and get another car to get out of the state. Or they weren't sure if there was somebody that would be willing enough to help him, put him in a vehicle, get him a vehicle, something of that nature. But they weren't seeing that he was able to, to cobble together any resources to, to leave the state. Um, their biggest fear was that, especially after the confrontation with the homeowner on Monday, was what was next is he was going to steal a car, and he's at a level of desperation that what would he do to get that car? And that was their biggest concern moving forward. And they just kept saying that he didn't have the resources, but additionally, Another sign that one investigator told me was the houses that he was going to, uh, you know, when they were first describing the people that, that he was going to, what his relationship was with them, they kept 
referring to them as former work associates. So how close was he really with them? So what level of desperation are you at if you're reaching out to somebody that, that you worked with that maybe wasn't a super close friend of yours to see if they'll help you knowing your, you know, incredibly violent history? So that, I'm told, was, you know, kind of a sign that he may not be able to find the resources to, to continue to move out of the state. Now, they also said when they, now going back to the van that he stole that was discovered Sunday morning in East Nantmiel Township, um, they said in that situation he ran out of fuel. Um, and, and that's why he, he ditched the van there. So they wonder maybe if he would have gotten any further. Um, but at that point, you know, he had the van for a good amount of time that he probably could have crossed over at the very least into Delaware with it, with the amount of fuel that, that he had to at least make it, you know, it was about 20 miles that he drove um, in that van. So their biggest, the other day, what they kept saying was, you know, the resources, the resources. He went back to an area where he knows, he knows people. And yesterday, um, Bivens had said that they do believe that he knows the area the, in the perimeter where he was found. Why? I, I don't know. You know, we do know that he worked in the area for, for a long time. Uh, he's somebody that his entire life has always worked on farms. So he, he knows his way around farms. He understands farmland and, you know, that vegetation that we were talking about that really was difficult to get through. And, I, you know, I know we just had video up showing those investigators. I mean, we're talking chest high vegetation that you walk through. You can't necessarily even see what's in front of you. And, you know, and also, you know, on average, you know, a lot of those investigators are, you know, probably between, you know, five, eight, six foot. And again, this guy's five feet tall. So how can he maneuver through this vegetation as opposed to somebody who's maybe, you know, a larger build? But again, we're hearing the information. You saw that picture of him as well, wearing the Eagle sweatshirt. Uh, I was curious to know whether or not how, how much he had changed his appearance, because when we saw the picture of him in the green hoodie from the ring camera that, that we've shown a lot, that's when we learned that he no longer had a beard and he was clean shaven. I had thought, oh, he for sure probably shaved his head because he had that distinctive curly hair. But right there, looking at the picture, he clearly did not. The pants he's wearing are still the pants that he had um, in prison. The boots that he's wearing are presumably those boots that he stole on Monday night because the shoes that they found in the field were the shoes that were issued to him by the prison. And so that's when they had a, a positive, you know, ID that, listen, this has to be him because of the, the prisoner shoes. So what he was found in, that sweatshirt, also something that he may have even stolen post-Monday, post his confrontation with the homeowner on Monday. And then you start to think, okay, well, where did he steal it? Did he break into another house? Like, we may find out very well that he may have stolen something else or broken into another home um, even after Monday. And when they talk about doing a debrief, I don't think they're going to find out everything. And who knows how forthcoming he's going to be. Um, I don't know how strong his English is as well. They need to bring in an interpreter um, over the course of the 14 days. You know, initially they said that. Portuguese is his main language, um, but he knows some Spanish and some English. But what I heard from some investigators was when they were interviewing a lot of the inmates in the prison uh, for the Spanish-speaking inmates, um, they had said, you know, his Spanish isn't very strong. Whether or not that's true, um, you know, I don't know. So, But in the debrief, they're basically going to assess him. They're going to see um, his physical condition. You know, he may he's most probably dehydrated. Uh, they're going to have to you know, just make sure that he doesn't have any serious injuries to him, which if he did have any serious injuries that go beyond a dog bite, which we do have confirmed he was bit by a search dog, um, then that's something that he could potentially be taken to the hospital for. But, you know, this is a guy they don't want um, out of the custody of heavily, uh, you know, uniformed <laughs> guards at this point. You know, they, they don't want this guy in a hospital. They want him in their in their grip they don't ever want him to be out of their eyesight again absolutely so, annie stick with us because we uh the news conference is going to begin any moment now uh with governor shapiro and also lieutenant colonel uh george bivens uh you talked about the what perhaps a language barrier uh, speaking portuguese being from brazil and also uh, whether or not cavalcante is going to going to be forthcoming no matter whom he's speaking to in whatever language right 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is a guy that's now defeated. And, you know, 14 days to be on the run from authorities. And, you know, I mean, this is a guy that committed a heinous, heinous crime. He brutally stabbed Deborah Brandau in front of her children. And in 2017, uh, the reports are that the murder he allegedly committed, because he wasn't convicted of it back there in Brazil, was over an argument over damage to a vehicle that he lent a friend. Um, So this is a guy who, you know, is a dangerous man, yet everybody in our area has been fascinated by him over the past 14 days. And for the members of the communities where he was on the run, so the Copson Township, East Camp Nail, South Coventry, that area of Chester County, they've been gripped by fear. You know, not knowing where to go. School's been canceled. Things that you, you know, you don't expect in real life. They expect in a movie. So he's gripped that community in fear. But at the same time, he's captivated and fascinated people around the world. I mean, this has become beyond the national story. It's become an international story. And even in covering it out there in the field, you know, we, a lot of times, whenever something's a national story, you know, we see our network counterparts and whatnot out there. But this brought a different level of attention where there were so many people that, as each day passed, were just dumbfounded that he was still able to elude capture. And in part, you, know, you don't want to, um, you know, commend him by any means at all, because this is somebody that, that did something heinous. But at the same time, people, it, it's something that all prisoners, right, whether they're, they're guilty or innocent, if they're behind those bars, they probably all... Um, fantasize about breaking out of prison. And this guy was able to do it. And he was able to elude capture for 14 days. That in itself, people just have so many questions. It's something you can't wrap your head around. You know, I wouldn't last five minutes on the run. You know, so I think a lot of people are curious as to how he's able to survive. And again, you go back to the intel that they learned on him is that he is able to survive hot, humid conditions. He's able to survive severe weather. He's able to survive in jungle conditions. And when so, you're speaking of these conditions too, Annie, we're, we are learning some information from our investigative reporter, Chad Bradelli, who was ta- we we're talking about those lower temperatures that mm-hmm. we've had. And sources are telling Chad Bradelli that with that thermal hit that they had overnight, those lower temperatures made that possible. And the searchers still waited until sunrise for the safety reasons to move in on Cavalcante in that location under those logs um, with that thermal hit. So that thermal hit and the lower temperatures, as you were alluding to, is what helped them finally move in on Danilo Cavalcante. And we're also learning from sources that he will be interrogated to find out several things, including what were his movements? Did he get any assistance in all this? How many break-ins did he commit? And did he commit any other crimes? And we are learning that we're getting some more information here. All right, so here's a live picture from the action cam. This is the now famous pile of logs that Danello Cavalcante managed to wedge himself into in South Coventry Township. Again, this is in that within that eight mile search area that they developed in northern Chester County that they winnowed down a little bit overnight. And somehow Cavalcante was able to get himself into that pile wearing his Eagle sweatshirt, the pants that he was issued back at the prison and, and some boots that he's been wearing for a while and tried to hide under there, maybe under the tarp, maybe actually beneath some of the the logs themselves. And police, as uh, Eliana was just talking about, uh, finally with the temperatures uh, going down a little bit so the thermal uh, equipment can work, managed to locate him in this pile. They waited until sunrise so that they can definitely find him and see him in sight uh, with with the sun up and we're able to capture him at 814 this morning. Yeah, those, that's a, a massive pile of logs. It was not initially what I was picturing when we were talking about uh, hiding under a pile of logs. Essentially could have buried himself under there. And you have to imagine with all of that pressure, uh, the heavy rains, the lower temperatures, that definitely would have shielded him from the elements. But yes. You're looking at a spent man. Uh, this is an individual who's been on the run for 14 days. 
Uh, he's, his mere presence in communities has been terrorizing anyone who lives around there. Uh, his clothes are wet, his clothes are muddy, his expression is, is neutral, if not uh, just dumbfounded. Uh, they finally got me. Uh, he's in that uh, highly secured police vehicle, and he's on his way back to the Avondale Barracks, and he won't be seeing the light of day for perhaps the rest of his life, we shall see. Yeah, and we do know that that news conference was supposed to start at 9.30 this morning. We did hear from law enforcement that they needed a few more minutes and were experiencing a bit of a delay. Obviously, you can imagine with these developments this morning, uh, capturing him at 8.15 this morning and to have a news conference about an hour later is pretty significant. I mean, that just speaks to the, the level of law enforcement in this and, and wanting to be completely open and transparent with the community and with the public and get that information out as soon as possible. Sometimes we find law enforcement will notify us or the public about something like this after they've interrogated him after they've had a chance to sit down and truly assess him and the situation but we are going to be hearing from law enforcement momentarily yeah. so the, the the bottom line for everyone watching right now all our action news viewers particularly in the chester county area you can breathe a sigh of relief uh, Danilo Cavalcante is now in custody. Uh, we have so many questions that uh, we've been discussing throughout this broadcast when we went on the air uh, a little bit more than an hour ago. But, but that's the bottom line. People can breathe a sigh of relief. Schools can reopen. Uh, people cannot worry about taking their dog out in the middle of the night wondering if someone's lurking in the woods. Cavalcante is in that vehicle right now. He is in, under heavy guard and they are going to keep a close eye on this individual for the rest of his life. Absolutely. And again, just the sheer fact that people can now feel relief. The, you know, all this happening at the start of school for many school districts out there in Chester County. And this kind of, you know, upended a lot of things, a, a lot of normalcy for a lot of families in Chester County, kids going back to school, schools closing, Longwood Gardens on lockdown and closed down and, and just so many disruptions across the state for so many people with this one man who has been really just terrorizing people with his sheer movements. Um, and the fact that this is all coming to a close today, 14 days after his escape from the Chester County prison, it's finally here. And yeah. I've had people messaging me like, thank God, finally, sure. he is captured yeah. and this is done. Yeah. So once again, a news conference stand, uh, starting momentarily. Stand by if you're watching. Uh, we will bring it to you live as soon as it begins. Uh, some of the new elements that we've learned since we went on the air. He was captured at 814 this morning. He was found underneath a pile of logs in a rural area of South Coventry Township. He was wearing an Eagle sweatshirt which is something new, uh, but also still wearing the prison issued pants. And he had uh, some boots on as well. And you see his condition from being out on the run for 14 days, it wears on you. And certainly from his expression, you can tell he has. He also had some uh, bloodied areas of his head that police had noticed. And from what Annie McCormick tells us, we can confirm that he was bitten by one of the dogs, one of the canine dogs that picked up his scent uh, which allowed police to capture him this morning. And again, if you are just joining us, we've been learning from both Annie McCormick and Chad Perdelli about how law enforcement were able to move in on Danilo Calvacante this morning. Their tactical teams had found his whereabouts using thermal infrared technology. They were able to kind of keep track of his whereabouts with that technology. They waited for the, the obviously the lower temperatures made all that possible. They waited for sunrise because of safety reasons, because again, he just was able to steal a 22 caliber rifle so he was heavily armed it was a loaded rifle at that point as well so they wanted to move in at the right time to ensure their safety and they did so at sunrise and that's how they were able to find him under that pile of logs there in South Coventry Township. We saw the swarm of law enforcement officers out there in the last 30 minutes or so. Many of them kind of, you know, you can tell in their demeanor, they were relieved. They were kind of now breathing a sigh of relief that 300 law enforcement officers who have been working tirelessly to find this man, they finally found him. The nightmare is over and Danilo Cavacante is in custody. And for those hundreds of officers involved in this effort, job done in mm -hmm. terms of number one protecting the public no one was hurt despite the the, the alarm of what happening and look at this oh, wow. you see people there along the side of the street 
uh, watching the, the cavalcade, uh, the, the, uh, the parade of vehicles, the state police vehicles, as they go down the driveway at, at the Avondale State Police Barracks to take Cavalcante in there and put him back into a secure environment where he will not get away again. Uh, but again, uh, this is an individual who has been able to evade authorities for 14 days. Uh, his time was up. Uh, he could not uh, go up against the manpower, the woman power. Also, all the technology that really paid off this morning when the temperatures reduced and when the thermal technology started to kick in. That aerial view of all of those people standing around along the side of the road as Cavalcante is brought into the Avondale State Police Barracks just speaks to the fact that how terrorized this community was. People were some, at, you know, initially people were going about their lives but when they realized how serious the situation was and how impacted they could be. Many people were canceling plans, staying indoors. I know personally, you know, as a mother with two children, I was making sure I was double, triple checking that all my doors were locked, securities armed, everything, because you just never know. You can't ever be that person to say, it cannot happen to me. And here we are with a live view, seeing police taking Danello Cavalcante out right now. You see him there in what looks like some kind of um, foil wrap, probably because of the elements. Probably to keep him warm because sitting outside, lying outside overnight when temperatures dip down like that, uh, it really wears on you. It's, it's, uh, it's not something that most people can deal with. Mm -mm. Uh, trying to sit underneath a pile of logs uh, throughout a rainstorm which moved through uh, at about two o'clock this morning, at least in the Chester County area. So that is our first moving live look of Danello Cavalcante being brought into the Avondale State Police Barracks. Um, change of dress, but still weariness. And I, you have to imagine that law enforcement maybe were waiting for this moment right here. He is now out of that armored vehicle inside the police barracks. The garage door is coming down. It is a close. And we want to take a look now at the news conference in Unionville. We just learned that they need about five more minutes, but we do see law enforcement and state leaders starting to line up and to prepare for this news conference where there will be a swarm of reporters and people asking a number of questions. But the ultimate goal here was capturing him, and that is done. Uh, State Police Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens is standing there, the second person on the right. He has led this effort from the beginning. He has a long history in law enforcement and also a history of trying to find fugitives. Uh, so um, I'm sure that the state was very comfortable in him leading this effort. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about how he's taken a lot of criticism. You've watched some of the news conferences and, and people have asked the questions that people at home are asking. Why aren't you find this guy? Uh, you have 300 people uh, and he is one person. But we've also addressed all the difficulties, all the things that state police were up against, uh, the rural nature of what was going on, the fact that it was so hot, the thermal equipment wasn't working, and also Danello Calvacante's ability, uh, maybe perhaps learn while he was living in Brazil, where there are jungles, where there is heavy foliage, mm -hmm. able to maneuver around these things, and his small stature being able to hide in small spaces like, oh, by the way, a pile of logs. You know, for being a reporter at one of the news conferences and asking those questions, one of the things that I appreciated about Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens was his transparency. He was not afraid to go up to the podium and say, there were flaws in our perimeter. There were weaknesses in our perimeter, and we are now assessing those weaknesses. We knew there were going to be weaknesses. We had law enforcement officers, hundreds of them, surrounding this perimeter, but we knew there were spots that were weak, and they're admitting that and learning from that. But as you said, they have, you know, he's got a, a history, a career of capturing wanted individuals. So we knew that. You know, I think the American public and the people in the community of Chester County had trusted law enforcement to find Danello Cavalcante. They said on Monday he was growing desperate. It is no longer his game. It is our game that he's playing to, and we will find him. Yeah, two priorities. Number one, protect the public. We were just talking about that. Number two, find him, capture him alive, mm -hmm. and bring him back to justice. They gain their two priorities, they achieve their goals, and I'm sure that they're extremely pleased, despite the fact that this did take an emotional toll on people all of this time. Thank goodness it did not take a physical toll on anyone. Uh, there was that one incident where they came pretty close to 
someone perhaps getting injured, uh, a homeowner shooting at per a person in the garage trying to steal a rifle, uh, runs out of there. But again, everyone's okay. Everyone's safe. The only one who has to worry about anything right now is the person who's going back behind uh, four, four cell walls, and that would be Danilo Cavalcante. And I do want to mention and get back to that statement from the Chester County Commissioner and the part that we, we were mentioning is that they've made some immediate changes to bolster security in the prison. They've brought in security contractors to make permanent changes to the exercise yards in particular and are reviewing and where needed changing procedures for both security measures and communication to residents who live close to the prison. So that those are the changes that Chester County commissioners say they are making to the Chester County prison to prevent this from happening again. But we do know that they've uh, bolstered their communication as well. They had some reverse 911 calls that went out to residents this morning, notifying them that Danilo Cavalcante was captured. And we are just moments away from this news conference where we will continue to learn more about this capture. Yeah, so you have the state police podium, uh, several microphones on top of it, and then two posters that they just brought in showing the state of Danilo Calvacante when he was brought in with uh, state police in their tactical gear, their camouflage uniforms, uh, their binoculars on their helmets. Uh, he is the one standing there all muddy, all wet, and completely exhausted from running from police all this time. Uh, Hopefully we will learn much more about all the places he had been, uh, the places that he intended to go, and how he got out of that prison in the first place. The prison is where this all started, and this pile of logs in South Coventry Township in northern Chester County is where it all ended this morning at 814, where they finally found this inmate, uh, this convicted murderer and suspected of another one in another country. Mm -hmm. He was lying underneath that pile of logs, hoping, hoping, that it would protect him from being discovered and his hopes were dashed. And as we're taking a live look at this pile of logs where he was found, have we learned if this is a residential property? Is this a, um, is this kind of a, a, a business? Uh, I'd like to learn more about this particular location. We're gonna take, we're gonna kind of pan out here and see what we're looking at. Okay, so this looks like some type of business um, or maybe industrial property. We see a lot of those um, heavy machinery there. So it looks like he found himself in a place. I, I was curious about whether it was a residential property. Because can you imagine the person who may or may not be living in this property sure. waking up and saying, okay, that man was hiding under all those logs in my backyard, but we're seeing that this looks like more of um, some type of business there in South Coventry Township. Okay, we're, we're just learning, Eliana, your, your questions are answered. This is a John Deere store along Route 100, uh, which I'm pretty sure is still in South Coventry Township. Uh, so that is uh, where he was discovered, a business there. And, and there he is once again, uh, the, the, the coincidence unmistakable, f having found a, a discarded perhaps or maybe stolen an Eagle sweatshirt and getting captured the day before the home opener at the link. That's the news conference and they're all set to go momentarily. Yeah, we are awaiting Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens with the Pennsylvania State Police who has been leading this investigation all along. He has been at that podium day in and day out updating the public uh, on exactly what is happening, what they're doing, their efforts, how many law enforcement officers, the increased amount of resources from state and federal authorities to capture Danilo Calvacante. Yeah, we were so pleased to inform uh, the public of his capture at 8.14 this morning. Uh, the, the relief, I'm sure, cascaded all around, mm -hmm. uh, particularly all those school children who were, had to stay home. Maybe they were going virtual. Uh, the, the moms and dads worried about their children playing outside. Uh, the people going to the gas station, turning around their back, wondering, you know, is this guy right behind me? Uh, the person uh, taking a walk in the evening as the sun goes down, wondering if there's someone in the woods nearby that they need to worry about. All those worries are over. All those worries are done, and he is now in custody. And we're just learning. Uh, Annie McCormick is still on the phone here. And Annie, so you were actually at this location, this John Deere store in South Coventry Township on Monday night. Talk to us about that.
Yeah, so when I'm looking at the map just okay. now, so on Monday night when all of that activity unfolded, it was probably was between like 8 and, and 9 o'clock when they were establishing that perimeter, and then around 10 o'clock is when the shots were fired. We were live in our 10 o'clock newscast right there and 11 o'clock at Prizer and Pottstown Pike. Pottstown Pike is Route 100. And it was in, in that area that, that we were doing our reports. And now I'm curious to know if he maybe was initially in that area. I wonder if he went back and forth there and used those logs more than once. Uh, to maybe that's a structure that he found and then moved up the roadway towards where, you know, that homeowner's house was because it's not far at all from from that location. And that's the thing, you know, Eliana, it's funny, you just said, imagine if, you know, you woke up and you're like, oh, my goodness, I live right near where you know, right behind where, you know, that fugitive was, was caught is that, that people like all day have been wondering, is he behind me? Even us in the media, you know, we go live at night and you, you know, you're looking around and it's really dark and you wonder he could be totally watching us right now. And that was a big question. Um, a lot of us had, um, you know, he, we know he's around here and they kept talking about him being in that perimeter. So that John Deere store, uh, you know, we're, we're showing you a live picture of it right now. Um, that is again, right on, um, Pottstown Pike. That's, uh, you know, been heavily traveled road and, and area. So I'm wondering, did he cross Pottstown Pike? I don't think so. I think he still was within that perimeter. And then I'm told that it was this morning, you know, after they were able to, to get a hit, um, using that thermal technology that they made the perimeter that they had established Monday and Tuesday. Significant. All right, Annie, Significant. Uh, forgive us. We have to break off from you. Thanks so much for your reporting. There's Governor Josh Shapiro introducing everyone at the news conference at the Unionville Fire Company. I'm pleased to be able to report that thanks to the extraordinary work of law enforcement officials from here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, our local leaders here in Chester County, and from our federal partners all across this nation. Shortly after 8 a.m., our suspect was captured. I want to say, first and foremost, thank God there were no injuries to law enforcement or to the public. We obviously became deeply concerned after the suspect was able to steal a weapon. He was apprehended this morning with no shots fired. I want to say thank you to the dedicated law enforcement professionals from every level who each and every day go out of their homes, leave their families, leave their loved ones to keep us safe. The public over the last 13 days has had a chance to see what excellence in law enforcement means, what true, dedicated professionalism is all about. I couldn't be more proud to be standing up here today with these professionals from every level. And while they did extraordinary work, we had a tremendous assist from the public here in Chester County. I want to say thank you to the public for their vigilance. Thank you for the constructive tips that they shared. Thank you for remaining on guard. We recognize this has been a concerning and trying time for each and every one of you in the region. And we want to thank you for your support of law enforcement and for your support of this effort that led to this capture today. I hope the good people of Pennsylvania and indeed the folks all across this nation got a chance to see how government is supposed to work, how law enforcement is supposed to work, where we all come together, where we focus on the mission. And while the women and men up here behind me may wear different uniforms and different badges, we were here with common purpose, and that was to apprehend this suspect and keep people safe. Leading this effort has been the Pennsylvania State Police. And I know I'm going to get booed by some of the folks behind me for saying this. I believe they are the finest law enforcement agency in the United States of America. And I could not be more proud to be the governor of this Commonwealth and to have the chance to serve in public service alongside these great leaders in the Pennsylvania State Police. Leading the effort for us is Colonel Christopher Paris, who did yeoman's work overseeing this operation together with Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. 
All Pennsylvanians, gentlemen, are indebted to you for your bravery, for your courage, and for your tremendous leadership. And with that, it's my honor to bring up the Colonel of the Pennsylvania State Police, Colonel Christopher Paris. Thank you, Governor. I would like to make a few brief comments. I'd like to dedicate those comments to the victims of Cavalcante and their families. At the end of the day, all the people behind me here work for justice and for the victims. A close second to the people of Chester County, we appreciate your support and we appreciate the dedication that you have shown us and the generosity that you have shown us. We are in your debt. Uh, this was a major operation. We know that it has affected your lives and we're very much uh, appreciative of that support. I'd like to thank the governor and his support of us, uh, not only with his physical presence, but his work in Harrisburg on a daily basis. I'd like to thank the Border Patrol, Customs, the FBI, the Marshals, the ATF, our federal partners, the Chester County District Attorney, Deb Ryan, and her Chief County Detective, Dave Sassa. Our municipal partners, too numerous to mention here in Chester, Montgomery, Delaware, and Bucks counties. We could not have done this without, without everyone. Uh, I would like to thank, from the bottom of our hearts, the members of the Pomar Lynn Fire Company. I know the media has been in and out of here. Uh, the hospitality that they have shown us, the logistics that you need to bring to bear in an operation like this, we, we would have been hard pressed to do that without them being good hosts to us. Lastly, uh, but certainly not least in any way, shape, or form, to the women and men of the Pennsylvania State Police, thank you. Thank you for your hard work and your diligence. Um, this is my third manhunt with Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens. It's not lost on me that it was nine years to the day yesterday for the uh, Blooming Grove ambush. And in all of those uh, operational cycles, there is no person uh, who enjoys more of my trust and confidence. Uh, he was tasked with standing this operation up. My confidence in him is marrow deep. Uh, he is the consummate professional, and I would now like to turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Bivens to give you the operational rundown of the capture of Cavalcante. Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Colonel. It is uh, a true pleasure to stand here this morning and uh, talk to all of you about uh, bringing this manhunt to a successful conclusion and without getting anyone else hurt, most importantly. None of this would be possible without the support of this team, represented by uh, members of various agencies standing with us up here, by others standing throughout this fire hall, and by still more who are out there in the field. So let me give you a few details about how this unfolded. As you know, we have been uh, working most recently in a uh, perimeter established in northern Chester County. Last night, shortly after midnight, a series of events started to unfold. First, we, uh, we had a uh, burglar alarm at a residence near Prizer Road within the perimeter. Uh, our people investigated that, did not, uh, did not find Cavalcante there or anyone else, but it brought, it started to bring some of our people into that area. Uh, we had been searching an area not far from there already with some tactical teams that night. There was uh, an aircraft overhead utilizing uh, FLIR technology, and uh, close to 1 a.m., picked up a heat signal that they began to track. It was west of PA 100 and north of Prizer Road. Tactical teams began to converge on that location where the heat source was moving. Uh, unfortunately, we had a weather system that also came in, and we had lightning that was flashing all around, and it caused the aircraft to have to depart the area. Tactical teams made a decision 
to uh, secure that area, that smaller area, as best they could and hold it through the storm and until uh, we could bring additional resources in and bring aircraft back overhead to ensure that we did not have uh, an issue with an escape. That resumed early this morning and shortly after 8 a.m., tactical teams converged on the area where the uh, heat source was. They were able to move in very quietly. They had the element of surprise. Cavalcante did not realize he was surrounded until that had occurred. That did not stop him from trying to escape. He began to crawl through thick underbrush, taking his rifle with him as he went. One of the Customs and Border Control teams, Bortac, uh, had a dog with them. They released the dog. Some of our PSP CERT members were also there, had him surrounded. The dog sub subdued him, and team members from both of those teams immediately moved in. He continued to resist, but was uh, forcibly taken into custody. No one was injured as a result of that. Excuse me. He did sustain uh, a minor bite wound. Uh, we had uh, medical uh, personnel at the scene, and they, uh, they took a look at that. Cavalcante was, as I said, taken into custody. He was transported to our Avondale station for further processing and interview, and he will ultimately be transferred to a state correctional institute where he will be housed and begin to serve his life sentence. In just a few minutes, I'll open this up to some questions, but I uh, before I do that, I want to turn this over to one of our, our very close partners, District Attorney Deb Ryan. I know she would like to say a few words, and again, then we'll be happy to take your questions following that. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. Today is a great day here in Chester County. Our nightmare is finally over, and the good guys won. We owe a debt of gratitude to all of the first responders for their tireless and dedicated efforts in bringing this fugitive to justice. They worked around the clock, and we are deeply grateful to all of them. Our community can finally regain its normalcy and breathe a collective sigh of relief. This would not have happened without the collaboration and efforts on behalf of a multitude of agencies. I need to thank the governor, Colonel Paris, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens for his unflappable and dedicated leadership, the U.S. Marshals, the Chester County Detectives, the FBI, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, the Department of Emergency Services, the Sheriff's Department, and every single person who went out into the field in the most horrendous conditions. We had weather problems, we had terrain problems, and a, and a ton of obstacles that prevented our capture from occurring is as expediently as we wanted. We have the best people in the business and we never lost faith that this capture would occur. We knew that it was just a matter of time. The scope of this manhunt was extremely impressive. The brave men and women who went, there, went out there every single day are our heroes. And I am proud to be a part of this collective team of, of people who worked around the clock to bring this man to justice during this monumental challenge. They utilized every piece of advanced technology, dogs, drones, helicopters, every asset available was put out for this capture. I can't express our gratitude deep enough to all of them and to the community for their support. We received dozens and dozens of donations, well wishes, and kind support from everyone in the community. And we thank this firehouse for housing us. We know we disrupted their lives for a while. One of the first calls we made upon learning about this capture was to the Brandau family, who, as you can imagine, have been living in a complete nightmare. They are so grateful to the men and women who helped with this capture. They can now finally sleep again. I can't thank law enforcement enough for their efforts. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, we will be happy to take your questions. Yes. With the uh, helicopter overboard, we saw the arrest taking place. There was some criticism about the photo op that was taken with the fugitive. Can you explain how that's actually a standard procedure or what's the reasoning behind the photo op with the fugitive? 
Uh, you know, I'm aware that there was a photo op that was uh, taken out there. Those uh, men and women worked amazingly hard through some very trying circumstances. They're proud of their work. I'm not bothered at all by the fact that they uh, took a photograph with him in custody. Again, they're proud of their work. They kept the community safe. Uh, I say thanks to them and good job. Sir, did he say, sir, did he say anything in the moment that he was captured and you released the name of the canine officer who bit him during his capture? Uh, we will probably not be releasing uh, the name. Uh, and in terms of anything that he said, uh, we, we need to use an interpreter, and he has been taken back to the station, and, and at that point uh, we will attempt to interview him at the Avondale station. Did he say anything upon capture, anything at all? Uh, I'm not aware of it. Uh, if he did, um, I, I don't have that information. Well, Lieutenant, 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 your officers were authorized to use lethal force if he didn't actively surrender. Was the goal to always take him in alive? That's always our first, uh, first choice and preference. Uh, again, that option is only to prevent the escape of a very dangerous individual. Had they not been able to contain him, that would have remained an option. Who specifically made the arrest? Which organization? It was a combination. It was a combined group of uh, the Border Patrol and PSP. Well, he got really he was when he went into the van, he was stripped and had his uh, tattoos photographed. Is that normal procedure? Yes. When was the thermal imaging happened at 1 o'clock, was he in the same location when you found him? Later? Wait, I'm sorry. You, you'd ask first, man. Was he asleep when you found him? Uh, he was proned out. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I've not been told that he was asleep. I'm told that he was proned out trying to hide and then began to crawl away. Was it the same location when you got the thermal imaging at 1 you found him at 8? It was in that uh, close proximity to that, yes. What was the weather that you were helping him? Uh, no one was uh, assisting him at that point. Sir, what was the agency that was flying the helicopter that first um, spotted the key? Uh, that was the DEA, and that was a fixed-wing aircraft. Were you worried as, as law enforcement that you had to down the plane and there could be another chance for escape? I mean, that's obviously the plane had to land, but what kind of risk did that did you have to calculate with that? Well, you know, as I've told you throughout this investigation, there are always things we have to contend with. Everything isn't scripted and doesn't go perfectly. And so it's just another challenge. Uh, worried, I don't think, is the word that I would use. Uh, we simply had to adapt. And so we secured that inner perimeter while always keeping our outer perimeter secure so that if he did manage to get out of that inner, we would box him in yet again. How tough an adversary was he? You've led some very high profile. You know, I don't know that he was particularly skilled. He was desperate, and I've said that all along. You have an individual whose choice is go back to prison and spend the rest of your life in a place you don't want to be or continue to try and, and evade capture. He chose the evade capture. Um, he was in good shape, obviously uh, able to climb, as you saw, to get out of prison, but, uh, but ultimately... Uh, as I said all along, we had an amazing team assembled here, capabilities that are just very formidable, and, uh, and I was confident all along that he would eventually be captured, and, and ultimately this team, and I credit all of them, uh, for bringing together their collective experience, the resources, and being able to apply that and, and capture him. It's never easy to find someone who doesn't want to be found in a very large area. Sir, there was, uh, previously, you said you were reserving comment of, on if anybody was helping him throughout the search. I know you said no one helped him this morning. Can you say now that he's in custody whether he received help these last 13 days? Uh, there were people who were intent and intended to assist him. We had been successful, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we had been successful in preventing that assistance from reaching him. Does that include his sister? Yes. There had been some frustration, some criticism from the public as this was stretching on. Now that it's over, do you consider this anything other than a success? No, it was absolutely a success. And i got to tell you, I think uh, by and large the public stayed amazingly supportive. I had uh, some third grade students stop by yesterday and drop off letters and notes of support for all of these uh, responders. We put them out for, for them to see at uh, briefing time and things. <laughs> That's the kind of support we saw from this community. There will always be criticism. There will always be people who think they can do this job better, and, and they're entitled to that opinion. Uh, what I would tell you is, again, I put my faith in this group of experts, this group of seasoned law enforcement professionals, the dedicated men and women, not only of the Pennsylvania State Police, 
but of all of the other partner agencies who went out there every day. I'll put my money on them any day of the week, and, and I believe the community supported them and continues to. Will there be a charge with escape, and when will those charges be filed? We'll be discussing with the district attorney what, if any, charges uh, will be filed. But uh, for right now, again, there is a commitment, and he is going to begin serving his life sentence at a state correctional institution. What, what is his sister now? Uh, she is in the uh, deportation proceedings. That will proceed as had been initiated. Do you know where Cabo Conte got the eagles? I'm sorry? Do you know where Cabo Conte got the eagles from? I do not. Other than the, uh, the rifle, what did he have with it? Did he have anything else? Uh, just the clothing and things that he was wearing. Did he attempt to shoot? Did he attempt to try to disengage? He did not have an opportunity to, no, sir. How many officers were on the ground as he converged? Uh, I don't have an exact number, but uh, looking at the teams we were sending in there, in the immediate vicinity was probably uh, 20 to 25. And can you tell us more about what those 20 to 25 looked like? Like, did they have specific armor? Yes. They were, tactical, they were a tactical team, you would expect. You know, camouflage, uh, full armor, uh, long rifles, that kind and of thing. which agency? Customs and Border Patrol. It was their BORTAC team out of El Paso. And then Pennsylvania State Police CERT. It's our special emergency response team. Once on the ground, uh, from, they, they've now pinpointed him, right? They're on the ground and they're quietly moving in place. Length of time? Uh, from that point, uh, probably five minutes, it played out fairly quickly uh, once they had uh, identified him and moved in. He detected uh, uh, them at that point once they were already in position, and again, he started to crawl away, and it played out very quickly then. Sir, what is your greatest lesson from this 14-day uh, manhunt? You know, I, I don't know that there's any single lesson. I will tell you that I learned something from all of these, and, and, and as I told you before, I bring that experience to the next one. And so... Um, I just go back to it's all about the team. It's about assembling the right group of people, the right technology, uh, the, the people with can-do attitudes who will stick with you through the investigation. And that's what we did. Uh, and it's worked well for us in the past, and I'm sure will work well for us in the future. Colonel, said there were people intending to help. I just want to see if we can get a little more detail from you on that. You, you did mention you did confirm the system was intending to help. Who else might have been attempting to help? And the reason I'm not going to talk about that again, as I mentioned, we will be discussing with the, the district attorney whether there will be any additional charges. Uh, I don't expect that there will be on that aspect, but we want to have that discussion uh, before we, uh, so we disclose anything else. How the police catch him? No, I, I think he stopped because his, his uh, normal. <coughs> Uh, pattern was to travel in the late evening, earlier overnight hours. Uh, whether he got tired or whatever, normally he typically didn't travel then later at night, and he typically did not travel during the day unless we pushed him. And uh, we did have several instances of that where he was pushed and had to move. But, uh, you know, he doesn't have night vision or anything like that, the type of technology that many of our operators had out there. And so, uh, Traversing rugged terrain is difficult to do. Uh, I, I believe uh, it was just easier for him to do in the uh, late evening hours and late you afternoon. Know, that that the dog uh, I believe that's uh, that's what caused it. It was a scalp wound, and and uh, they bleed pretty significantly. I'm told there was not any significant injury. Did he have a phone? Just one, uh, ma'am. No, I mean, all along, you know, we asked people to secure as best they could. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he was still able to acquire some of those things. Again, those are just some of the challenges we deal with in, in an investigation like this. Uh, our people rise to those challenges, and, and ultimately, uh, again, he was Lieutenant successfully Colonel, captured. I know that uh, you led the effort also uh, in July earlier this year when that the person escaped using bed sheets. It was a chocolate lab that ultimately led to his arrest, and now here we are again, you're talking about a canine moving in and basically disabling Cabo Conte. Can you just kind of talk about the, the having canines and their use and how much of an asset they are when you're trying to navigate tough terrain and, and, and track down dangerous people? Sure. I mean, in the case of Trucker, or Tucker, he was kind of a civilian. Uh, I would say we deputized, uh, yeah, and brought him in. Uh, 
Uh, he's now an honorary member of PSP, but uh, uh, lab. Uh, but he was not involved in this. That was in Warren that uh, this gentleman was referring to. Just, uh, you know, I, I, I believe it was a shepherd or a um, Mal Belgian Malinois. Uh, just one minute, if I can come back to this gentleman, I, I apologize. Uh, in any event, uh, canines pay, play a very important role, not only for tracking, but also for, um, just like in, in a circumstance like this, safely capturing someone, far better that we're able to release a, a patrol dog like this and have them subdue the individual than have to use lethal force. And so, uh, again, our preference is always to use other means. Canines play a very important role. For those of us who aren't familiar with the area, can you tell us a little bit more about where he was and experience he was in front of a commercial building? Was he hiding within that building or was he He was in the wooded area, again, west of, area. West of PA 100 there. PA 100. Okay. Are you aware of how he was getting nourishment and, you know, liquids? No, that will all be part of the interview we'll attempt to do. Uh, whether he'll talk to us or not, that's uh, obviously entirely up to him. But, uh, but that will be something that, uh, that we'll be asking. Sir, at this juncture, can you release where he worked in Chester County prior, worked in Chester County prior to his 2021 arrest for homicide? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have that, uh, the list of those locations. I know that he did uh, a variety of jobs installing flooring. But, uh, but I don't have the specific list of, of work locations. How yes, long will he be at the Avondale Barracks? Uh, long enough for us to process him and however long a, uh, an interview lasts with him. Uh, I don't expect it to be for a very extended period of time. And, and again, at that point, he'll be transported to an SCI. And what, what Sir, was there any concern that he would team up with another small man to step inside the trench coat, little rascal style? No. You know, again, I didn't see the uh, sp this specific capture. What I would tell you is the way those dogs are trained is to simply um, uh, go to the person. They will uh, grab whatever is closest for them to grab, and then they are trained to detain that individual. They don't. They don't just keep biting and releasing or trying to cause additional injury. They simply um, uh, grab onto and try and hold that person in place until officers can get there. So that's why they're never released, uh, you know, at some great distance or unsupervised. Uh, uh, there are officers close by who can then move in. The handler can immediately pull the dog back off of the, uh, they give them a command, pull the dog back off, and then officers take over from there. He did. You mentioned uh, I don't have the name question, right now. With, with, was there any body cam footage or doggy cam footage in the situation of him getting up the rest of anything happening? Not that I'm aware of, and sir. And secondly, Border Patrol, is, are they here? Yes. Can we talk about the, the expertise of Border Patrol being here to to make that arrest? Do you want to? What, what, what your experience played and how that made a, if you could step up? Sure. Now, Border Patrol is trained in tracking and pursuing. From the time a, an agent comes on duty assigned to the south, southwest border, they get lots of experience tracking and trailing people. And then with our, our technology and other resources that just aids in the, the searches like uh, this this one. Different terrain than, than normally what you're working with, correct? So Border Patrol is assigned to both the northern border and the southwest border. So. We got training and experience in all types of terrain. Can you tell specifically what you did here? What did you do here? Did you we assisted uh, the state and federal, state and local partners with our resources, whether performing uh, observation at night, um, search searches during the day, searches during night, and then obviously we had our uh, our tactical teams here. Question for Governor Shapiro. Governor, yesterday you described just not 24 hours ago, right here, that you were calm and that your commanders over this operation were also calm. Uh, in hindsight, how did you balance the obvious pressures from outside that were forever saying, find me yesterday? Look, we had a job to do, and that was to capture Cavalcante. And I had the absolute best team working on this. I'm proud to be associated with the Pennsylvania State Police and all the law enforcement uh, leaders who were behind me, federal state and local. We knew we had the best. 
and we knew as Colonel Bivens said multiple times he was desperate and it was just a matter of time. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of them. And I want to come back to two questions over here that are related uh, to Mr. Holden's question. Um, one was about the assets that we deployed beyond the people. I hope that the public takes great pride in the technology, in the canines, uh, and in all of the assets that were brought to bear here. We ask a lot of the public through their tax dollars to support the police, to support law enforcement at every level. And they got a front row seat here in Chester County and across Pennsylvania to see the extraordinary work not only these individuals do, but the great technology we're able to bring to bear to ultimately capture um, dangerous suspects like this. The public should take great pride in that. And then to the gentleman's question there in the suit, um, folks, whoever had their Eagles hoodie stolen, if you could let us know, I'll do my best to get you one of those new Kelly Green ones, okay? Governor, can I just ask you, two escapes, uh, two different individuals from the same prison in the same year. What do you say to people who live in this area and say, what is happening at the Chester County Prison and what are you guys going to do moving forward to try and prevent this kind of thing from ever happening again? Here in Pennsylvania, our system may be a little different from other states. We have state correctional institutions and then we have county jails. In this case, the Chester County Jail um, is run by Chester County officials. They'll answer uh, those questions as to what occurred and what changes are ultimately going to be made. Certainly the State Department of Corrections will be here to assist um, in any reviews or in any other work that they need done to make sure that that facility is secured. They obviously have a lot of work to do there um, and I'm confident under the leadership of uh, Chairwoman Moskowitz and, uh, and District Attorney Ryan and other leaders in the county, they'll get that done. Is it estimated that the cost of the manhunt is about a million a day? I, I can't, um, you know, put a price tag on it. We'll do our best to make sure that whatever can be tallied up is and is shared with the public. At the state level, I can't speak for our local or federal partners. Governor, Governor you, mentioned, mentioned, you mentioned the pattern of, of what time of day you would travel. Were there any other patterns that you picked up on that were key in, in, in tracking and containing him and then possibly uh, there were There were a number of things that, um, that we picked up on. And, um, it, 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 he didn't follow the same pattern every single time. Um, seemed to like to travel uh, via creek beds. He liked other paths of less resistance, wood lines, power lines, gas lines, that type of thing. And that's actually fairly normal. Um, nobody wants to have to uh, uh, force their way through very heavy underbrush and things. Uh, and, and again, I mentioned the time of day, but, uh, but all of that combined with some outstanding work and technology is really what, uh, what brought this to a so successful Marty, conclusion. How many people in Chester County are grateful for your efforts? I know you mentioned on Friday you were asked about containment and capture. Ultimately, that tactic was successful. Anyone that you would like to thank at this time, I know Land Hope donated breakfast yesterday, Wawa has been big help with lunch, any small businesses you'd like to thank, and then again the people of Chester County. I will tell you that uh, we have been compiling a list, and I don't want to stand here right now because I will absolutely miss many. Um, some of those that you mentioned uh, have been outstanding supporters of us, and I thank them. Uh, we will publish a list of all um, who, who helped us out because we are very, very appreciative. That level of support is really one of the things that allows our people to focus on the task at hand and, and to you know, try and be successful even quicker than we might otherwise have to be. When I gave you all a tour of the facility in here, you know, I talked a lot about logistics and the support that's required to field a team of three, four, five or more hundred law enforcement officers out there uh, it, it takes a lot to, to put it out there. And so the help of all of those folks, the help of the average person who stopped by and dropped off a case of water was very much appreciated, not only for the case of water, but also just for the kind thoughts of, uh, and words of support that they always included when they dropped that off. And contained and captured so that tactic was the way to go. Yes, as I said, uh, we always take a multifaceted approach. And so depending on the circumstances, there's always a contingency and we're always prepared to move in whatever direction we need to. I'm sorry. Were officers wearing any body cameras and all that footage? 
I don't believe any officers uh, on the tactical teams had them on. Is there any aircraft involved here um, with the heat, um, with the heat seeking a cooling? Is that a DEA um, aircraft? Was it fixed wing from Brown helicopter? Also, did the arrest happen in South Covington? It was a DEA fixed wing aircraft. I believe that's South Covington. I would have to look at a map. We were operating in several townships there, but again, it was north of Prizer and west of PA 100. Sir, where were you when this all happened? And do you have a personal feeling of satisfaction for 14 days of very long, hard work? How does this feel for you this morning? I was here in the command post when the capture occurred. And uh, uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm very uh, happy that this occurred and that no one was injured. You know, it brought a new level of danger for all of our people out here in the field when we knew that he obtained a firearm. And so uh, for me, the biggest sense of release, uh, relief is that no one in the community was harmed and no law enforcement officer was harmed either. So that's, that's really, that's the win. No, I believe he was more mobile the entire time. Sir, what prison is he being transported to? We're not releasing that, uh, but it is going to be a state correctional uh, facility, and once uh, he is secure there, I believe uh, they will release uh, where he is being housed. Senator Colonel Dennis, you said that multiple people attempted, attempted to help him. Did he have any means of communication to reach out to those people and coordinate with them as to where he was? Uh, he did not at the time that, uh, that we captured him. And yes, ma'am. Well, as I addressed uh, a few minutes ago, yes, he had the firearm with him. Yes, he was a threat. He did not have an opportunity. I believe he was uh, taken by surprise, and I believe the canine played a large role in him not being able to utilize that firearm. What I would tell you is, again, that it is our last choice, our last preference to use lethal force. And so while there were other options, the team did the responsible thing, did what they're trained and what we expect, and they used other options. And again, lethal force is always the last option. He's going in for questioning. What kinds of information are going to be trying to get from him? Like, what kinds of questions will we ask? Uh, I, you know, uh, we have the criminal investigators that have been involved in this, everything from the escape up through the time that, uh, that he has been on the run. I'm sure all of that will be uh, included in their list of questions, whether he'll choose to talk. I have no idea, and uh, and that will be his choice. Can you assure and guarantee the public that this man will not escape again? Because clearly he has the ability to do that. Can you say that now? I can assure you he will not escape while he is in our custody. He will be turned over a state correctional institution. I have every confidence that they will be able to safely and securely house him as well. Lieutenant Colonel, was he in the perimeter of the, the perimeter that you had outlined yesterday? Was that he was. He was. Okay. Yes, sir. How close to the edge of the perimeter was he? You know, where on the perimeter? Uh, it was within the perimeter, and he would have been within a few hundred yards of the eastern edge of the perimeter. Colonel, in terms of the public being involved, there was uh, video surfacing of uh, visual antiques in Chester County trying to get involved in this case. Uh, moving forward, if something like this happens again, what would you tell the public in regards to getting involved in a case like this? I would ask them the same thing that I ask this time, and that is please don't come out and try to become involved like that. You take away, you potentially take away resources that would otherwise be spent on the search trying to deal with those individuals, and we don't want one of them to get hurt unintentionally. How okay. far was the capture from where the burglary happened last night? Uh, within a quarter mile. It wasn't. It wasn't a burglary. It was an alarm, by the way. But uh, well, once processed, any idea in the ballpark time until transfer? Uh, it depends on whether he is cooperative and is interviewed. That could take minutes to hours, but uh, I, I don't have the answer uh, yet whether he's. Have a lawyer, do you know? uh, I'm not aware of that. Sir, do we know if his sister and mother entered the country via Puerto Rico as well? I don't believe his mother is here, okay. and uh, I don't have that information immediately available here about where they entered. As I said, uh, the sister, though, is in the process of being deported now. We have time for two more questions. Lieutenant yes. Colonel, after everything that you've been through, seen with Cavalcante, once that interpreter is there, do you plan on having a conversation with him, asking him anything about all this? No. 
the, uh, the investigators are quite competent. Uh, they'll gather the information that uh, we believe is important if they're able to, and uh, uh, I'm confident that, uh, uh, that everything we need will be gathered in that way. There's no reason for me to have a personal discussion with him. What's your message to anybody else who tried to escape? Well, I think it's a very bad idea, obviously, uh, and, and we will be here should something like this occur again. We'll put the team back together, and we'll be right back out after them. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you've been watching the uh, news conference there from Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. We also heard from Governor Shapiro, and we learned a lot of information about what unfolded overnight. We sh let's walk you through uh, what they just told us here about the capture of Danello Cavalcante. It all started with a DEA fixed-wing aircraft right. that has been circling that area of Chester County now for days, and it had the thermal imaging on it, and it picked up on a heat source. Well, we've been talking about for days now that that heat source, that heat detection system, wasn't really working because the temperatures have right. been so hot, but they hit on it last night, and they were following this heat source. Then those storms moved yep. in, but the teams did not move out of that area. They centered in on this area where Cavalcante was eventually captured with the help of a search dog. Yeah, and he also still had that gun, the gun that he had stolen just a couple of days ago. He still had that on them. Now, they say they had the element of surprise when they found Cavalcante. They, about 20, 25 guys from the uh, borders, uh, Custom and Borders Patrol and also state police, they moved in quietly. They were able to have him surrounded, but he still tried to get away, started crawling through the brush with that rifle, and that's when they released the canine dog, which really was the, the key to catching and stopping him. And uh, the dog did bite him as we're taking a, a look at uh, some of the video a bit a little while ago there at the Avondale Post where he was taken in for questioning. Yeah, at this point, then they will bring in a Portuguese interpreter. They're going to see if he cooperates with them. He does not have to, but as all of us do, I'm sure they have many questions yeah. as to how this 34 year old was able to evade capture for 14 days, escaping the Chester County prison Thursday morning, August 31st. The history books will now show he was captured September 13th, 2023. You know what I think is really interesting about the capture, the way they describe it, he did not give up until well after this canine had been released on him. They said he was still trying to resist as he was crawling away through the brush. He would not give up until that canine was released and bit him as we're taking a look at a picture of his bloodied face. Uh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens touched on that bloodied face saying that it's not a serious injury at all. It just uh, the head does bleed a lot when it, uh, there's an injury. Um, and then there he is with that Eagles jersey. And I, I did, there was a moment of levity uh, when mm -hmm. Governor Shapiro said, hey, whoever's Eagles jersey uh, was stolen, whose Eagles sweatshirt was stolen, I'll do my best to get you a new one. <laughs> it is a very Philadelphia ending to this story. Absolutely. Uh, given that the home opener is tomorrow night. But that aside, he is in custody. That community can now breathe a sigh of relief. He was captured at uh, it's a tractor dealership called Littles at 2555. Pottstown Pike. Um, there are a number of big piles of, right. of uh, logs there. They're not sure, we're not sure exactly which one he was mm -hmm. maybe concealing himself under or whether this was sort of his home base. And yeah. maybe he was going out at night, but uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens did confirm that, that they did know his pattern was to be on the move in the evening hours. And every time we, we heard about a sighting, almost every time, it was after dark as he would move around. And that's that uh, pile of wood that's behind Littles, uh, and this is the area where he was captured where that heat source uh, picked him up. And it just makes you wonder, was he using different, uh, you know, logs and things like that to hide under, to, to hide himself from aircraft and maybe these, the thermal imaging that they were trying to use with the, with the weather, though. We know the weather was really a big part of all of this search the last two weeks because it's been so hot finally cooled off enough for everything to kind of work uh, to the advantage of law enforcement out there looking for Danilo Cavalcante who has now been captured after 14 days on the run. So many questions about how he evaded police and we don't know if we'll ever actually get those answers. He's a determined man. He's escaped in the past. There have been accounts of them escaping capture uh, after an arrest in Brazil. Uh, he also, when he was first 
uh, accused of stabbing to death his ex-girlfriend. He was on the run to Virginia. As we mentioned, this wood pile here, uh, 2555 Pottstown Pike, and that's where we find our Caroline Goggin. She is there in South Coventry on the scene where this capture happened, where he was taken into custody. Caroline, what can you tell us about the terrain there and what you're learning? Well, Sarah, a very wooded terrain behind us. We are at Little's John Deere Tractor Supply, as you mentioned. This is off of Pottstown Pike, right by Prizer Road. This is where state police say their capture of escape prisoner Danilo Cavalcante played out this morning. And we talked to the manager here, Jim Martin, who says around 2.30 in the morning, they got reports of police officers overhead and on the ground in this area. He says he got here with his son around 7.30 in the morning. He saw hundreds of law enforcement officers out there in that wooded area. Area. They eventually pulled Danilo Cavalcante out of the woods, brought him up here to this parking lot where there were hundreds of law enforcement officers stationed. They ended up putting him into an armored vehicle in shackles before they took him away from this area of northern Chester County. And speaking with Jim earlier this morning, he tells us they are just so relieved this is finally over. And that's really the sentiment from all of these people in northern Chester County who have been on edge for the past two days. And we also just heard during that press conference from Governor Josh Shapiro, here's some of what he had to say about this capture. We were here with common purpose, and that was to apprehend this suspect and keep people safe. Leading this effort has been the Pennsylvania State Police, and I know I'm going to get booed by some of the folks behind me for saying this. I believe they are the finest law enforcement agency in the United States of America. And back out here live once again behind that Little's Tractor Supply off Pottstown Pike here in South Coventry Township. You can see this pile of logs. It appears that this is one of the piles of logs behind this business right now. There are a couple just within eyesight. Police were focused on this area this morning when our crews got here onto the scene. So we're trying to determine right now if this was the pile of logs that Danilo Cavalcante was found under. Wednesday police were finally able to capture him this morning again, ending a 13-day man hunt that has really had the people here in Chester County just on edge for the past couple of weeks. That's the latest live in South Coventry Township. I'm Caroline Goggin. Back to you guys. Caroline, talking to that manager there, I know people out there at all the time we're wondering, is he in my backyard? Mm -hmm. Is he right here among where I, where I am? Any sense from him about how he is feeling knowing this guy was right there on his property? He actually told me that it was kind of exciting coming this morning, not that there was a convicted murderer on his property, but because this had finally come to an end. He said he wasn't surprised that he was back here. Again, I want to show you this area, guys. This is a very wooded terrain, and Jim Martin, the manager at Littles, tells me that behind this wooded area, there's a small stream, and then there are a couple of homes. So he said he's been in contact all morning with the homeowners here. They actually live off of Prizer Road, off of Route 100, and they said all night last night they heard law enforcement, they heard the police presence, they heard helicopters overhead. So he said, you know, not very surprising that Cavalcante ended up here. It is a wooded area. It was probably easy for him to hide. We've been talking about it for the last 13 days. He's only five feet tall, so he could really blend into the woods right here. So again, Jim was telling us, you know, this wasn't a surprising place for him to be, but really they're just so relieved that it's all over. And I can tell you guys, I grew up here in Chester County. People around here, I've been talking to them for the last couple of weeks. They are just so thankful that this has finally come to an end. Back to you. Yeah, there is that sense of relief. Finally, you know, we saw as Cavalcante was being brought into the Avondale uh, barracks, all the people lining the streets, they were clapping, they were cheering because this is finally over. And I know when the news finally broke this morning that he'd been captured, uh, I don't live entirely far from that area. Everyone at the bus stop was just so relieved. <laughs> they were saying we can finally open our windows and, and our doors again because they had been kind of hunkered down for the last it's several been days. It's an ordeal. It has been, I, absolutely. I think even if you weren't in the, the Chester County proper, yeah. this entire region was sort of feeling tense, wondering absolutely. where he might turn up next. Now let's turn to Action News reporter Chad Perdelli, live at the Avondale State Police Barracks where Cavalcante is currently located.
Yeah, John Cavalcanti arrived here about an hour ago. He's now inside the Avondale Barracks being interviewed by investigators. They're trying to learn what in, whatever information they can from the 34-year-old. Let me give you a, a view from behind me. There's the SWAT bobcat that he arrived in with the flashing lights. Now, detectives inside, they're going to try to find his movements, find out about his movements during those 14 days on the lam. Obviously, this is a man who is serving a life sentence for murder. So while they want to find additional crimes, any burglaries he may have committed during those 14 days, really key for investigators is to find out who may have assisted him during that uh, that time uh, as he was escaping from investigators. They're going to try to find if anyone at all assisted, whether it be money, communication, or any of that that could bring additional charges. Circling back to when he was captured around 8.30 this morning, uh, state police say they were using that thermal imaging that you talked about. They uh, got a hit overnight uh, around 1, 2 a.m., but they waited until sunrise for safety precautions. Then Customs and Border Protection, along with state police, moved in and uh, with K-9 were able to capture him under some logs. Uh, you saw uh, Cavalcante, he was bloodied, but uh, not injured enough that he had to go to the hospital and was brought back here to the Avondale Barracks. Now, how long he'll remain here is unclear. It depends on if he cooperates with investigators. He could tell them he doesn't want to talk, uh, I request a lawyer, and then he would not be here very long. I'm told he will be going to SCI Phoenix after he leaves the Avondale Barracks. But, uh, you know, obviously state police want to learn as much information as they can because they were so close uh, to capturing him. He was ultimately, ultimately captured at Route 100 in Prizer in that area. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens said he was actually captured only a couple hundred yards from their eastern side of the perimeter they had set up to uh, to uh, get him. So he was uh, obviously trying to make another escape, but, uh, you know, 14 days on the run, he was obviously tired, uh, tough terrain, and uh, uh, state police and uh, Customs and Border Protection, with the help of that canine, were able to get Cavalcani. I want to show you over here just to our right. You can see how many people. Obviously, this, uh, this story has captured um, the attention of so many people in our region, even nationally, and, uh, you know, it created a lot of fears, a lot of worries in, you know, Chester County and the surrounding areas with him on the run, especially with that rifle when he got that rifle yesterday. But you can see so many people trying to get a glimpse of Cavalcante when he may emerge from the Avondale Barracks. Uh, when that will happen is unclear, but investigators have a lot of work to do trying to get as much information as they can. But the key here, he was captured and no one else was injured. Live at the Avondale Barracks, Chad Perdelli, Channel 6, Action News. Back to you guys. Yeah, Chad, I mean, uh, there's so many people gathered there now. I mean, you can tell just how this affected everyone, this search that went on for so long. I mean, these are just people, what, that live nearby? They heard about the capture? They wanted to come out this way? Yeah, I mean, I arrived here, you know, about a half hour ago, and the cars were lined up. You know, there's people across the street, you know, down this way. I mean, there's people all over the place just trying to get a glimpse of this 34-year-old that, you know, you know, really was the center of attention here news-wise uh, for the better part of two weeks. So, you know, it, it did create a lot of worry, as you know. I mean, anytime you have a man like this who is an escapee, who committed, a, you know, one murder here that he was convicted in the United States, is wanted for another murder in Brazil. It's going to create concerns, especially when he's breaking into homes, uh, confronting homeowners in a garage when he stole that rifle. And, uh, you know, that homeowner fired some shots, but it, was, uh, it looks like unable to hit him. You know, that's going to create concern and uh, obviously a lot of tension out here. Chad, yeah, tense. 14 days for people in that community. And even remember the people back over by Longwood Gardens for days there, 20 miles away. They too have been on edge. Our Trish Hartman is live now in South Chad. Thank you. Trish is live in South Coventry as well, talking to people there about how they're feeling now that this uh, escaped inmate is in custody. Trish. Yeah, Sarah, we've been talking to a number of people this morning. We spoke uh, with a, a couple of women who came from the King of Prussia area, and they just came because they wanted to kind of be in the area and see it for themselves. They have been following this case so closely over the past two weeks, so they were here this morning. We also spoke with a woman who lived within the search perimeter, and she said that she is just breathing a sigh of relief. She couldn't even express how relieved she is after the events of Monday night uh, when Cavalcante stole that rifle from that resident. 
residents. Um, they said they left their home last night because they couldn't do one more night. Uh, so they were overjoyed to hear about his capture today. Now, again, we're along Pottstown Pike at Little's John Deere, uh, not far from where Caroline Goggin is. And I just want to show you the front of this store. Uh, and he, Cavalcante, of course, was captured behind all of this. So you can just see all of the equipment. And it just looks like your, your typical uh, uh, John, uh, John Deere business here. Um, but then behind all of this is where that pile of logs is that you've been seeing all morning. And then behind that, this densely wooded area. So we did speak with the uh, store manager, Jim Martin, this morning. And they got here around 7.30 this morning. They said police were in the area, but they didn't know exactly where Danilo Cavalcante was. So they were just here uh, kind of watching the presence. Helicopters were overhead. Um, this place was packed with police and armored vehicles. And then here's what Jim Martin, the store manager, said happened next. We, we basically just saw uh, them storming the, you know, checking the tree lines, checking the, the, the stream. And out of nowhere, everybody started to congregate back by the shed. And here they were already bringing him out. And then we watched him basically walk him up. One um, camouflage trooper had his gun, his rifle, and then they were walking him up. Yeah, Jim Martin said that he saw Danilo Cavalcante in that Eagles shirt. We asked if uh, he could tell that he was bloodied or injured, and he said he wasn't able to tell from his vantage point. There were so many officers around him, they were only able to get a short glimpse. He said it was very odd that uh, the suspect was caught right behind his store, but he wasn't necessarily surprised. Again, uh, so many woods and vegetation behind the store, so he said he's not surprised that he was able to hide back there. Um, they also said they. they they are relieved that they're finally able to get back to business after two weeks of this search for Danilo Cavalcante. We're live in South Coventry Township, Trish Hartman, Channel 6 Action News. All right, let's get right back. Trish, thank you. To the command center in Unionville, the uh, governor of this Some, commonwealth uh, is addressing reporters. Without incident. Hey, governor, I can't help but wonder what went through your mind when you got the call and said, we got him. Look, just pride pride in um, the work our law enforcement did. Uh, I thank God that no one was injured. That was my first question to the colonel. Uh, was anyone hurt, law enforcement or public? Uh, and to know that these professionals just went out and did their job uh, should make us all proud. Thank you, everybody. Governor, thank you. Sure. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, you've been listening there. That was Governor Josh uh -huh. Shapiro uh, addressing reporters there. Just tremendous yeah. pride, as they put it very uh, succinctly. The good guys won. The good guys won. You know, and I also think the uh, the uh, Deb Ryan, the DA there in Chester County, kind of summed it up for everyone in that news conference when she said, "Our nightmare is finally." over and you know that's why you know when we're talking to our reporters at these different areas they're all seeing that that sense of relief we, we heard people cheering when chad perdelli was there in avondale and uh, we also heard from the manager at littles and how relieved he was as well yeah if you're just joining us this all unfolded this morning mm -hmm. out there in chester county they found uh danello cavalcanti in a kind of a wooded area near some wood piles behind a tractor dealership there um um, 2555 Pottstown Pike is the the uh, area where he was found and taken into custody with the help of a search dog. In fact, we've obtained the mm -hmm. radio call that residents received this morning after this happened. Yeah, people in the area breathing that collective sigh of relief after receiving this message. Listen. Do we have it? The radio room, Chester County government, and the various other agencies working on the prisoner escape are proud to announce the subject is in custody. Repeating, subject is in custody. Authority of the radio room, time 0818 hours. That's how it ended, right? Yeah, there. the confirmation for residents there, the confirmation for law enforcement, and the proof here 
Danilo Cavalcante in police custody, wearing new clothes, that Eagles sweatshirt. Uh, he's bloodied after this arrest. Uh, he was bitten by that dog, uh, maybe a bit of a head wound, as Lieutenant Colonel Bivens said, but he is now in custody awaiting interrogation uh, with the help of a Portuguese interpreter. We want to go back to the command center once again in Unionville. That's where Walter Perez is live for us right now. And Walter, you just spoke with the governor. That's right, guys. Governor Shapiro, incredibly proud of the work that was done by state police and all the other agencies. So many agencies, I couldn't even list them off, off memory. There were so many. But uh, it, it really was something where you look at how it was concentrated in one area at first and then to another area afterward. It showed you how, you know, loose control they had over the whole situation the entire time. Obviously, when it was happening, they couldn't give us too much information. They couldn't say exactly what was going on. But the indication that I get speaking with uh, Steve Now and people that I have contact with, that they say that most of this time they had a general idea of where he was. The question was just him poking his head out, making a mistake, letting, letting them know where he was and then closing in. And it really fell along those lines. There was a one episode, of course, where he slipped out of the perimeter. And that was something that obviously state police are not too happy about. But then they set up the other perimeter once they got a second bead on his location and all of the pieces fell into place properly, even with the weather working against them. I, I mean, the circumstances around the actual arrest read out like a movie. When you see the actual process that went to it with the heat seeking equipment that they used to find him and then the weather becoming an issue and they had to bring that helicopter down. That's starting at about one o'clock this morning and him being in the general same location at eight o'clock in the morning, several hours later, surrounding him with dozens of other officers closing in and making the arrest. Just really an impressive operation. And once again, just a short time ago, Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens had some comments. Here's what he had to say. They were able to move in very quietly. They had the element of surprise. Cavalcante did not realize he was surrounded until that had occurred. That did not stop him from trying to escape. He began to crawl through thick underbrush, taking his rifle with him as he went. One of the Customs and Border Control teams, Bortac, uh, had a dog with them. They released the dog. Some of our PSP CERT members were also there, had him surrounded. The dog sub subdued him, and team members from both of those teams immediately moved in. So once again, right there, just kind of picture exactly what he's saying under these circumstances. Men in tactical gear, they're in thick brush, cloud cover, kind of raining earlier on. The ground is wet. Cavalcante is under a, a thicket of, of, of brush. They move in. He tries to escape under the thickets. They release the dogs. He is bitten at least once by at least one dog, and they make the arrest. Like I said, it really played out like a movie and just an incredible job done by state police and all the other agencies involved in this operation. Back to you guys. Hey, Walter, one of the things um, throughout the course of this is we were wondering if Cavalcante was getting help from anybody. I think Bivens did address that a little bit, saying that, you, you tell me, he saying something to the effect of there were some people who had it in their mind to assist him, but that was thwarted. Is that your takeaway from that? That's what Lieutenant Colonel Bivens did say. He said as far as any kind of communication he had with the outside world, it was extremely limited. As far as they know, he had no cell phone this entire time. So if he did, they would have been able to catch the ping coming from that cell phone. He didn't have that as far as they know. Uh, there's very little cell service. We've been struggling with that this whole time over the past couple of weeks. In this part of Chester County, cell service is kind of poor. Um, but at this point, the indications are that he did not have a cell phone with him, that his communication with the outside world was limited. He was pretty much isolated out there that whole time. Once again, the way we reported over the past couple of weeks, he made some attempts to contact people that he knew that were, that were acquaintances. Uh, there were some family members as well, but by and large, he was pretty isolated the whole time. And the fact that he was able to survive this long uh, on his part, the one thing you can say positively about uh, Danilo Cavalcante is that he survived this whole time under very difficult circumstances. But the clock was ticking the whole time. As far as having enough food, as far as having resources, dealing with the elements, the weather wasn't the best the past couple of weeks. There were a couple of nice days, but you had other days where it was rainy and cloudy and really hot. So uh, just everyone persevering, coming through, and making the, the arrest 
a truly impressive operation by everybody involved. Yeah, and you know, you know I think a lot of people actually wondered why why did he stay in Chester County? I mean, he had slipped the perimeter uh, and had gotten that van, but he still stayed in Chester County. And, and the state police had touched on that. They believed that he was still in Chester County. They believed that they had had him uh, generally surrounded, but for two weeks going back and you know, throughout the county, it just really was amazing that that he didn't try to get somewhere else. Well, Walter, without any great and, resources, and that's, he couldn't have gotten anywhere, probably. Was, well, that's, and that's the whole thing. Anything we come up with regard to that at this point is conjecture. And just speaking with investigators that I know here on the ground, they say it could have been any number of things. The one thing that's a possibility is that this is what was familiar to him, that he knew the area to a certain degree. He realized that his options were limited. Um, he realized that he's very recognizable. He's five feet tall and his features and are kind of distinct and there's photographs of him all over the place. Once again, this is all conjecture, but just speaking to investigators on the ground here, it seems as though he realized that his time was limited and that he was just going to stay free for as long as he possibly could under those horrible circumstances. And in this case, it lasted two weeks and they were able to find him. But there were a number of things working against him. Once again, lack of a cell phone. Uh, you know, the way everything's kind of set up electronically now, where would he get the cash if he did steal a, a car to get the gasoline to move it someplace else? Where would he go? Uh, he's a very recognizable person. So, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds as far, as far as what he was thinking. He's being questioned right now, in fact, at Avondale Barracks with the state police. Uh, but those are one of the questions that I'll ask him, I'm sure, and maybe we'll get that information later. But at this point, who knows why he stuck around, but he did, and they were able to find him. Well, hopefully we can get those answers sometime soon because all of us want to know how how he was able to evade, right. why he stayed. Walter, thank you for that. Yeah, we're coming up to the top of the hour now, 11 o'clock. This is our continuing coverage of the capture of 34-year-old Danello Cavalcante, the escaped inmate, the convicted murderer, looking ahead at a life sentence, escaped back on August 31st mm -hmm. from Chester County Prison, captured today, September 13th in quite an operation that developed quickly during the overnight hours. Yeah, so it started around uh, 1 a.m. when they got a heat signature from a fixed wing aircraft. They had been flying throughout the Chester County area. They had zeroed in on that perimeter and what the DEA had on board was thermal imaging and it picked up a heat source and so they went to go check it out. However, storms blew through overnight. You probably heard them. Maybe they woke you up. Well, that grounded the aircraft, so they kind of had to set up a perimeter and wait. And they finally went in around 8 o'clock this morning. That's when they found Danilo Cavalcante uh, by a wood pile. He was hiding. Uh, he didn't realize he had been surrounded. He was, you know, they caught him by surprise. He still tried to crawl away through the underbrush while holding his rifle that he had stolen just a couple of days ago. And that's when uh, they had Border Patrol there. They were helping out with this. They released a canine. The canine got a hold of him, uh, bit him. We saw a photograph of him uh, bloodied up, his face bloody. They say it was not a serious wound. Wound, but that is eventually how they were able to apprehend Danilo Cavalcante on day 14. Yeah, and we did hear as he was sort of trying to continue to escape capture, crawling, making himself flat. He still had that stolen 22 caliber mm -hmm. rifle with him, and we now have images of that. This is the rifle that he stole from a garage in that area. The homeowner actually saw him enter his garage. He was in there as well. Cavalcante grabbed this 22 caliber mm -hmm. uh, rifle that was equipped with a scope and a flashlight. This is what he was armed with. This sort of up the ante yeah. for law enforcement changed the trajectory of this search here once they knew he was armed. It's not the most powerful weapon, but it is a weapon and it can it can kill. Yeah. So it, they were they were particularly worried once he had that weapon in hand and that homeowner grabbed his own mm -hmm. pistol, fired fired at Cavalcante, but there was never any indication that he was wounded. Right, and that, and that really changed the tone of this search. They went from being extremely dangerous to armed and dangerous. And, you know, what they touched on in the news conference today, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens, is that no one was injured. Not a shot was fired in the apprehension, which is really amazing when you think about it. He went through such great lengths to try to get away and continually get away, but not a shot was fired. He was taken alive. He is now at the Avondale Police Barracks being interviewed about exactly how he got away. There's so many questions we all have. And 
unfortunately, we may not ever get those answers. Right, and we've been showing you this wood pile in the wooded area back behind. This is where the capture unfolded. This is where the heat sensors detected something, someone in this area. They very, very quietly, these highly trained law enforcement officers from Customs and Border Patrol, as well as the t special tactical teams from state police, crept up on this area, this wood pile where Danilo Cavalcante was hiding and moved in. They said repeatedly they had the element of surprise. He didn't hear them or see them coming. And even yet, he tried to get into the woods, crawling, making himself flat, mm -hmm. holding that rifle. They sent in that dog. He did suffer a, a wound from that, but that dog, that canine, really helped in assisting yeah. to uh, take out the, the threat here. And it's also amazing they didn't fire a shot because they were yes. granted, the, the they were able, if he was not surrendering, they were able to use lethal force. It, that had been and, authorized. And he was not surrendering. He was still crawling away, but they, they, they just released the canine and were able to bring him uh, into custody safely, as we've been watching. You know, in this 14-day manhunt, there was, you heard at those news conferences, some criticism of law enforcement. Sure. How did you let this happen? How, but 14 days, there have been... There have been many more uh, fugitives who've been escaped for many, many right. additional days. We have Walter Perez now with Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. Uh, we're now one on one. Walter, uh, we have lots of questions yeah. for him. One of which was if he could <laughs> sit down with Cavalcante, what, what would he want to ask him? Yeah, well, we'll get to those in just a second. But first, I want to say, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the air with us. Uh, just first question is, what's going through your mind? I mean, my goodness, two weeks, finally found him. What was it like when you heard those words, we got him? Well, relief, obviously, is the first emotion, I think, that, uh, that I felt and I think anyone would. You know, one of the things that you worry about with an operation like this is, uh, are you going to get anybody in the community hurt? And are you going to get any of the members of your team hurt in the law enforcement group that's out there? And so to have this come to a successful conclusion and not have to deal with any of those issues, that's huge. So uh, I'm just I'm very happy and thankful that we've come to this conclusion and we're here today. What were the primary challenges? I mean, obviously the terrain was one of them. Certainly the terrain was one. Weather, we had uh, significant heat and humidity. And, uh, and, and just uh, large areas that had to be searched. You know, I talked uh, at one point about Longwood Gardens. That was an amazingly difficult area for our teams to search. And then even out, outside of that, there were, you know, a lot of challenges to the terrain. There always are when you get somebody out in, into an area. But I tell people, uh, you know, it's, it's not as though you're rummaging through your house looking for a lost set of keys. Uh, <laughs> when you have multiple square miles of area, and it takes a tremendous number of people to secure that, and you have to support that operation first, and then you have to find the people at, with the talent and the technology and the time to search that several square mile area looking for one individual who does not want to be found. It poses a lot of challenges, and uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate to uh, have an agency with a lot of capabilities and to have partners uh, at the federal and local level that are willing to work with us and that, uh, that will bring their resources to bear as well when we need to, just as we will for them when they need us. And, and one of the questions we've been bouncing around in, in the newsroom is, is it more difficult in an urban setting or in a rural setting when you're doing this kind of operation? You know, I don't know that I would say uh, one is more difficult than the other. Each has its own unique challenges, and uh, there are limitations of what you can and can't do. Uh, and, and so you just have to be able to adjust. You have to know what the capabilities are uh, of your agency, of your partners, and be able to adapt those to the specific search. And, and juxtapose the resources that you did have as opposed to what you wish you might have had in terms of manpower for the original perimeter and for the second perimeter, like what's an ideal number of people to have and what were you working with? Well, you know, it really just depends on the size of the perimeter and, uh, and the ability to lock something down. Unfortunately, there's no way to know uh, what you may deal with on a particular day. And so you arrive at a scene, you, uh, you understand that you have somebody you're searching for, and so we started looking at maps and figuring out how we can secure that. Some areas have great road systems that lend themselves well to uh, positioning patrol cars as some of the first responders so that uh, you can quickly 
uh, put them in place. It takes longer if you're positioning people off of roads and having to direct them through wooded areas, fields, and so forth. It takes longer to secure the perimeter. And so the longer it takes, the bigger the perimeter has to be so that you can be sure that person is still in there. Uh, and there are just there are a multitude of things that go into how you initially uh, uh, develop that and what it takes in terms of the number of people. Uh, and then once that perimeter's up, then we start reassessing and how secure is it and, uh, you know, what do we have to do uh, to bolster it if, if necessary. What was it like when you got the calls saying this guy's got a gun now and now we know he's armed? Does that change anything in terms of the approach? You know, it really didn't change a lot for us in this case. We knew we had an individual we were looking for who had already committed at least two murders and uh, we considered him to be very dangerous and very capable of committing another murder. And so the question for us uh, wasn't whether he should be handled as that dangerous individual. It was uh, It's always good to know if he does have a firearm, but, uh, but we always treat Treated him as an individual who uh, may very well be able to obtain one and certainly would use it if uh, if given the opportunity. I know that Sarah and John are champing at the bit here to ask a question, so if you guys have one, tell me and I'll pass it along. You know, Walter, we're just very curious. I know that he probably has questions that he would love to get answered from Cabo Conte. What are the questions that, that he wants answered? Are there any questions that if you could speak with him directly, what would you ask of Cabo Conte? Uh, one of the things that I'm most uh, interested in right now is uh, about any assistance that he may have received, whether in the prison or outside of the prison while he was on the run. Uh, we have investigators that will attempt that interview uh, probably even as we speak, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have those answers. Uh, uh, but that's what I'm most interested in right now. Do you have a grasp on how many people he was in contact with in any way, shape, or form? Because from what I gather, he had no cell phone this whole time, correct? Uh, to the best of our knowledge, he did not have a cell phone this entire time. Uh, would that have made it so, easier if you had one? Or would you be able to ping the phone? Uh, it potentially would have made, uh, made it easier for us had he had it. Um, it also would have potentially allowed him access to other resources. So, um, you know, it's kind of a double-edged uh, sword, if you will. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what other assistance and everything, again, we'll... We'll look now to see uh, what we can determine, um, what our investigators have put together over time, and whether there's enough that rises to the level of, uh, of additional charges that will all be determined here in the, probably in the near, near future. Lieutenant Colonel, on behalf of everyone here in Northern Chester County, thank you for your work. It was an incredible operation, and it uh, ended as a positive a note as could possibly have uh, unfurled. So congratulations and great job. Thank you, and I just, again, I thank the community for their support, and I'm happy that they can now go back to their normal uh, routines and lives. So I'm very happy for them and glad we could help. And I'm sure a lot of people agree. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We do appreciate your time. So once again, guys, there it is, uh, the person who's been the face of this whole operation mm -hmm. for the past two weeks. Uh, he's been very forthcoming, and uh, he's answered every question that every media outlet has had. And now it's all wrapped up, and it's just uh, a real feather in the cap to have this whole thing wrapped up and Cavalcante behind bars. Yeah, we, and Walter, and please assure us that someone will get that man a cold beer <laughs> and a nap. I'll buy him one. <laughs> you, it, it's funny. You want to hear a true story? This yeah. is, it's funny you said that because when the news conference was over, he walked out, and all the other officials were still inside. And the first thing that happened when he came out, someone gave him a fish sandwich. <laughs> first thing that happened. And All other right. people started gathering around and gave him drinks and, and soda and things like that. So the community is so appreciative. And that was really the outpouring that he received when he walked outside from the media gaggle into the public. Well, hopefully he gets a good night's sleep yeah. tonight. Yeah, it'll be the first one in yeah. two weeks. Walter, thank you so much. <laughs> Great interview there. Yeah, let's talk to uh, Caroline Goggin now, who is in South Coventry Township. She is in the area where he was captured uh, this morning. And I know everyone there is just relieved this is over. Yeah, John, everyone here is just so relieved that this manhunt has finally come to an end. You know, the real incredible thing about all of this is that when we're talking about Chester County, he spanned a pretty good portion of the county. We started down in Southern Chester County in Pocopson and East Marlboro Townships. Sunday morning, we were joining you live from Phoenixville, where Cavalcante had gotten to on Saturday night after he stole that van from a local dairy. And then today, this all ended here in Northern Chester County in South Coventry Township. We spoke with the manager here at Little's John Deere Tractor Supply. Behind his business is where all of this went down. So we want to show you this 
wooded area right behind the business. Now the manager Jim Martin tells me around 2 30 this morning people who live in this area reported some police presence on their properties and overhead. He says when he and his son got to the business around 7 30 in the morning they saw a massive police presence and then he said around 8 o'clock with urgency more than 100 law enforcement officers were in the area. They ended up pulling Danello Cavalcante from this wooded space. They pulled him out and they brought him up here to this parking lot. We want to show you behind us and in this parking lot they had armored vehicles, hundreds of law enforcement officers. That's eventually where they loaded Cavalcante into an armored vehicle and then took him away to the state police barracks. We know that obviously people in this area are very relieved. Our crew who got here onto the scene just minutes after Cavalcante was taken into custody said that they spotted police officers hugging each other, shaking each other's hands. Obviously, they are relieved that this is over after 13 days of 24 hour searches for this convicted murderer who escaped from the Chester County Prison. I also want to show you guys, Yuri, if we can spin over to here. There is this pile of logs here. This is behind the tractor trailer supply store. It's also behind this tree business that's next door. This is where police officers were heavily focusing part of their investigation after Cavalcante went into custody earlier this morning. We obviously know per state police that he was hiding under some pile of logs. So we're still trying to determine right now if this is the exact pile where he was hiding. But Jim Martin, the manager here once again, told us that he was brought out of this wooded area this morning. He says that behind this is a lot of brush. There's a stream back there. It really would be an ideal location to hide if you were looking to do so. But again, guys, I mean, I just can't reiterate it enough. People around here are just so relieved. They've actually come to this parking lot this morning off of Pottstown Pike right near Prizer Road just to kind of see this site and take in what a lot of people are saying is a piece of history because this is a really big day for Chester County and really for the state of Pennsylvania that this man is finally once again in custody. Back to you guys. Yeah, it is finally over. Caroline, thank you. Let's switch things over to Catherine Scott, who is in Unionville as well. And, and Catherine, you were on this story early this morning. I mean, the overnight hours you have been out there in Chester County. Give us a sense of, uh, you know, what it was like leading up to these moments. Well, you know, it was still an active search site early this morning. We were at the perimeter and there was a checkpoint there. So when cars would try to come out of the search zone, say a civilian who lived within the search area, there were police officers at that checkpoint with flashlights. They'd have you pop your trunk. They'd take a look inside the vehicle and they talked to the driver. So it was still very active overnight. And we're now learning that there, were a, there was a lot unfolding behind the scenes within that perimeter. So early this morning, uh, they got that heat hit, but they went to go into the area. They still had aviation overhead and they were hindered by lightning. So the aviation unit had to step away for a, the time being, but the tactical units were still on the ground. They were still circling in that area. And then a team of between 20 to 25 uh, people, uh, tactical units, started closing in on him around 8 o'clock this morning. They said that it was all over within about five minutes, that he was in a prone position. They don't know if he was sleeping, but they he did not realize that they were closing in on him until uh, very much the last moment. And that's when he grabbed his gun. He started trying to crawl through the underbrush. But of course, he was taken into custody. People asked what he said upon being taken into custody. Uh, so far, police haven't said uh, if he had any words. Of course, he was taken in for questioning now. And we've heard uh, about a lot of the questions, a lot of the information that they want to hear uh, from him. Of course, he eluded capture for two weeks in this very very challenging terrain. Authorities saying that his normal pattern seemed to be to travel during the overnight hours. Of course, he was in an area that was very challenging. There was chest high vegetation. This was a thickly wooded area. There were tunnels in the Longwood Garden area. So this really was a challenge for these law enforcement officials who said it was like finding a needle in the haystack. Well, in the end, they found that needle. He's taken into custody. No shots were fired. No law enforcement or community members were injured and Cavalcante finally brought in and captured. Guys. In the next step in all of this, Cavalcante will be transported to SCI Phoenix. He is no longer going to be in a county facility. He's now moving to a state prison. And that does conclude our breaking news coverage of the capture of Danilo Cavalcante. For right now, we'll have much more on Action News at noon as well as on 6abc.com and wherever you stream 6abc. And we now join the view in progress. 
paid for my own wedding dress. And I remember being like, what the hell? My best friend came up with a hack, which was she got married on New Year's Eve, said it was a New Year's party, and the venue was 25% less than if she had said that it was her wedding. Oh. It's, it's a joke, like the way that the, these companies make oh, money off of weddings. Wow. And there's also so many events associated. I, a, a wedding is just like really the wedding, but sometimes there's like the grooms people throw, throw a shower, the 